I'd like to call the Canton Township regular meeting of the Board of Trustees to order on March 23rd at 6.31 p.m. So, Clerk Seegers, can you please take roll call? Borninski. I was unmuted and I muted myself. Mm -hmm. I am here and I am in my house in Canton Township. Foster. Good evening. I'm from my home in Canton Township. Ganguly. Good evening. I'm here in Canton Township at my home. Graham Hudak. Good evening. I'm here in the Township Hall. Seagrist, Canton, Slavens. Good evening in Canton Township. And Snyderman. I am here and I'm in Canton Township. Thank you. Everyone is here. So can I have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? Are we? Okay. We're not, no modifications? No. no. All right, I move to approve the agenda as presented. Support. Support. Thank you, Clerk Seegers, please take roll call on the motion to adopt Borninsky. the agenda. Aye. Foster. Aye. Ganguly. Aye. Graham Hudak. Aye. Seegers die, Slavens. Aye. Steinemann. Thank you. Motion passes for the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes for March 2nd, 5th, and 9th? Madam Supervisor, I move that the board approve the minutes from March 2nd, 5th, and 9th as presented. Support. Support. Thank you. Please take a roll call on the motion. Clerk Seabrist. Borninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Ganguly. Aye. Graham Budek. Aye. Seagrass Aye. Slavens. Aye. 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 Great, thank you. Motion passes to approve the minutes. Our first um, item on the agenda is the presentation of the CDBG review. So who? Um... I believe that would be me. Yep, okay. yep I, can, I can introduce a little bit. We, um, sometime, I guess it's back in the fall maybe, a time flies when you're having fun. The board approved uh, Wade Trim to provide our um, five-year consolidated plan for CDBG, which is a required uh, five-year um, plan that has to be filed. So uh, Jason Smith is with Wade Trim. Um, he has been an excellent resource for us. Uh, he's got a lot of experience, works with a lot of municipalities, especially with CDBG, uh, super knowledgeable. So he's going to walk through uh, a presentation. He's got a PowerPoint. I believe he's going to share a screen um, to go through a presentation with you guys to talk about the process, talk about what types of things are eligible, and to help answer any questions you might have. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Jason. Hey, Wendy, everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us tonight. Um, it's uh, good to work with Canton Township again. Uh, we Wade Trim assisted uh, Canton with their previous five-year consolidated plan back in 2016. And uh, we were, they were gracious enough to, he's been gracious enough to hire us back for uh, this five-year plan and we're looking forward to, we've been enjoying our time working with Wendy, Carolyn and Mike over the years. And um, you know, we're going through the process right now of this plan and we know that there, um, every five years there can be some, some changes in, in every community uh, with, with elected officials, with decision makers uh, and with uh, local officials uh, within the departments at, at a, in a community. Uh, so we always find this five-year plan a good opportunity to provide a, a bit of an education, CDBG 101, as I believe is what Mike and I call it. Um, ho hopefully, we can teach you a little something about the CDBG pr program, um, the, what you can do, what you can't do, some of, the, uh, some of the requirements for the program to help aid in some of the decisions you'll be making uh, over the course of uh, this five-year plan term. Uh, so as we said many times here, five-year consolidated plan. This current plan that we're working on will cover program year 2021 through program year 2025. So that will, uh, that will kick in on July 1st of, uh, of this year. And what is a consolidated plan? So uh, Wendy touched on it a bit. Uh, it is our five-year planning document that governs the use of our CDBG funding that we get on an annual basis. And for those that aren't familiar with the CDBG acronym, that's the Community Development Block Grant Program uh, that's been funded since 1974 through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. This document's going to serve, as I mentioned, as a planning document. Uh, 
a bit of a blueprint, if you will, uh, for decisions that will be made over the, the course of the five year period. Uh, it also serves as an application to HUD. Uh, it is a grant application, but just a much more elaborate grant application than probably accustomed to writing and submitting. Uh, within the plan, uh, there are two main elements. I think that these are two of the more interesting sections of the plan. One is the strategic plan, which will identify goals for the five year period. And these are generally um, kind of a 30,000 foot view of what the community development goals will be uh, over the course of the plan period. And then the action plan, which a lot of folks tend to skip straight to that section because that's where all the dollars and cents are. What projects are we going to fund? How much money are we getting? Um, those types of things. So the action plan is also a, a incorporated within the five-year plan. Um, and keep in mind, uh, we are preparing a five-year plan. That annual action plan only covers one year. Um, so the subsequent years, the township will be required to, to complete an annual action plan with each year. So you always have the opportunity to do different projects from year to year. Um, if, if you feel that you need to change uh, or pivot at any point and, and fund a variety of projects the course of your five-year period. With any five-year consolidated plan and frankly, any annual action plan as well, I, I like to think of these plans as being citizen-driven. Um, the, the township does have a citizen participation plan that is sp specific to the CDBG <clears throat> program. And it does lay out a number of meetings that will be held. What will the process be throughout the, uh, throughout the preparation of these plans? Um, where that people can gain information at, where, pl where plans will be available for public view, those that type of information. We take a look at that citizen participation plan every five years to, to see if there's any updates that need to be. Generally speaking, uh, that doesn't need any major updates from uh, every five years, but, but nonetheless, we do revisit that plan to see if there's better opportunities to engage the public throughout these, uh, the development of our plans. Additionally, within the five-year consolidated plan, and this is really the bulk of it, you're going you're gonna to find, if you, if you do view the five-year consolidated plan, it's a couple hundred pages long. It's, it's quite, a, quite the document. Um, but a large portion of it does cover uh, what's called the needs assessment and market analysis. Uh, that is very data heavy, a lot of census data, a lot of HUD data where we take a look at uh, your community, your population, um, your housing uh, within the community, and try to pull out of that, what are some of the needs? Uh, what are, are there any glaring needs specific to populations within Canton? Are there any uh, areas that maybe we need to focus resources? Um, and are there any populations we, that really need some help with, with the Community Development Block Grant Program? Um, I've, I've listed here four categories, really is what the, Kind of the broad categories that our, our CDBG program does cover. And uh, that's specific to housing, homelessness, special needs populations, and uh, community development. Um, that you can think of community development as being more uh, physical improvements, infrastructure projects, park improvements, things of that nature. So we use these needs assessments, market analysis, and all the citizen input that we gain throughout the process to develop our strategic plan. Uh, as I said, our strategic plan does focus on goals over a five-year period. Uh, and then we, we develop our annual action plan, which is we actually show how we're going to expend our CDBG dollars on what specific activities from year to year. Uh, one important thing to remember is that any, fund, any projects that we fund under our annual action plan, uh, they should aim to achieve a goal that we've identified within our strategic plan. Uh, so think of it as you know, when you have your community master plan, uh, you, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Uh, and when you're making land use decisions over the course of a you know, 10, 20 year period, you wanna ensure that those land use, land use decisions that you're making tie back to a goal in the, in the larger master plan. Similar to this uh, with our five-year consolidated plan, we want our annual action plan projects to tie back to a goal that we've identified throughout uh, the process that we're going through right now. So with our CDBG program, as I mentioned, the Canton Township is an annual recipient, uh, which is their, it's an entitlement community is what uh, more accurately described. Uh, it, what, what kind of dollar amounts are we talking to from year to year? Um, Canton in fiscal year 2021 uh, has been allocated $370,973. Um, that is, fairly consistent with, with years past, that number does fluctuate from year to year based on the federal budget, but the, we have been informed for fiscal year 21 that that will be our dollar amount we'll work with. 
Now, to me, $370,000 is quite a bit of money. Um, but when you think of this on a broader scale, you know, Canton Township's a 36 square mile, 90,000 people living in it. Uh, you know, $370,000, we know, um, can't, doesn't go very far. So this is why these processes are important to help focus those resources uh, in areas that we feel will make the most impact. Um, and we are confined to several federal rules and regulations. A couple are cap requirements. Um, one specifically is our public service cap. So the, the township's not allowed to use more than 15% of their uh, allocation towards public service activities. So these are services like senior services, programs that serve the youth, uh, or any other types of uh, social service programs that might, uh, might serve uh, special needs populations. So 15% uh, is the max we're able to use on an annual basis uh, for those types of programs. And in addition, uh, the township is allowed to take up to 20% uh, out of the grant for administration purposes, and it helps to pay for uh, things like uh, salaries and plans and so on, and things that are required in order to actually carry out and implement the program. So that way the township doesn't have to foot the bill. An important thing to remember with CDBG funding is that it is not a, I guess, an open checkbook is my, my uh, usually my analogy I use. Um, the, the CDBG funding that is, that is expended in the activities that are carried out are required to assist low and moderate income individuals and families within the township. Um, so that's an important thing to remember as we're making decisions on uh, in thinking about different types of projects that we may wanna uh, embark on over the course of, uh, of, a, of a fiscal year is that the important, the important uh, goal for our CDBG funding is that we, we assist those uh, that are considered low and moderate income um, now, what does that mean for, for Canton Township? What does low and moderate income mean? Uh, within the uh, Wayne, within Wayne County, um, I, I've provided you with a, a dollar amount here uh, on my on my PowerPoint. Sixty two thousand eight hundred dollars for a family of four. Uh, so, if you if you are a family of four making sixty two thousand eight hundred dollars or less uh, on an annual basis, then you would fall. You would be defined by HUD as a low and moderate income family. And that number fluctuates based on how large your family size is. So that dollar amount goes up as your, as your family size gets larger and it goes down as your family size is smaller. Some other goals and areas that we can focus attention is to prevent, elim prevent and eliminate slums or blight. Um, so this is generally things like demolition activities, uh, programs to, to uh, prevent uh, blight within our communities. And then finally, uh, one that's, you know, I, I would always say this is a, a goal that HUD has defined as, um, I've always said that this is not very used very often, but uh, in this case, I, I have a good example. So the activities, we can spend funding on activities that meet community development needs having a particular urgency. My example was always natural disasters. And in, in Michigan, that didn't happen a whole lot. Uh, you know, you think tornadoes and hurricanes, a lot of communities that I work with in, in Florida will utilize this to help to justify funding particular activities because of the you know, hurricane activity there. But um, most recently here in Michigan, although it's not a natural disaster, something very different, uh, a pandemic has hit. So uh, we are able to qualify activities uh, under that uh, urgent need uh, category uh, to help fund programs that uh, help us to prevent and uh, respond to COVID-19. So I've given you a little bit of a background here on, on CDBG, what some of the rules are, um, what, what we can do, uh, who, we, who we should be looking to assist with CDBG funding. Now, I just wanna provide you with a little historical uh, knowledge specific to Canton Township uh, activities and programs that have been funded. Uh, I just pulled a, a handful of over the last five years uh, and put them on this, uh, on this slide here. Uh, so public service activities, I, I mentioned earlier, that's that, that category that is subject to that 15% cap. Uh, programs such as the Youth Connection, Legal Services, Domestic Violence Services, and Summit Scholarships have been funded uh, with CDBG funding. And again, those are primarily aimed at benefiting low and moderate income populations. Uh, most recently, I know the township has embarked on a rental mortgage assistance program with some of their uh, CARES Act funding. That was uh, additional CDBG funding that was allocated to the township. 
uh, as a result of the CARES Act. And I've uh, been working with Wayne Metro to help assist households, low and moderate income households that are um, having trouble paying rent or mortgages as a result of COVID-19. Uh, a program that's been funded for years within the township. I know that Mike uh, has been uh, pivotal in, in implementing the housing rehab program uh, in the township. And that's a, a program that provides uh, zero interest, low interest uh, deferred loans to homeowners, low and moderate income homeowners to help provide uh, funding to do rehabilitation on their homes. And then finally, uh, ADA facility and park improvements. So specific to ADA, eliminating ADA barriers within public facilities and within township parks uh, has, has also been other programs that have been funded with, with CDBG funding over the course of the last five years. So I keep mentioning low and moderate income households and low and moderate income person, but we also have areas that we can focus funding on. So if we're, we're funding, use an example of that park project, uh, doing a park improvement. Well, a park improvement is uh, would be required to be located within a low and what's defined as a low and moderate income area. Uh, and within Canton Township, we can see here, uh, there's not a, a whole lot of low and moderate income areas. Uh, and frankly, they have to make an exception for Canton Township, an exception to the rule, uh, because there are, uh, it is a, um, relatively speaking, more affluent community when, when compared to some other uh, communities in the area. But our, our blue census block groups here that are shown on, a, on my map, those would qualify as low and moderate income areas. So when we're, when we're thinking about projects that can serve a particular area, maybe not, maybe not a project that's going to serve one household or one individual, then uh, we want to make sure that we're focusing those projects within our blue areas on our map. And this information is provided by HUD and the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, so we, we do utilize that information in creating these maps. So uh, you can see most of those blue areas reside along the I-275 corridor with uh, a few scattered north of Cherry Hill and east of uh, Camp Center. Jason, is this updated for the most recent census? Do you know? It, it is, yes. Yep. Okay. So we expect yeah, it, it to stay the yeah, same five years? Yeah, I would expect this map to stay uh, the same until we have the 2020 census information. Um, your guess is as good as mine on when that's available. Um, okay. But the, uh, you know, it used to be these maps were created um, every 10 years, every time there was a, a new census. But now with the U.S. Census Bureau util utilizing the American Community Survey, which comes out annually, uh, they do take a look. Uh, it's, it's every uh, four or five years that the, there's a potential that your map could change. So we, what we do every year, um, take a look at that new data, download it, and see how, how that impacts our map. Um, I believe Mike and I spoke back in 2019, uh, and I, I updated this map um, then um, from our 2016 consolidated plan. And then the map that we're staring at here is actually identical to that same 2019 map. So the areas haven't changed since then. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So just a quick little snapshot here. I, I mentioned that, you know, I, I think it's important to, to view these plans as being citizen driven and we do what we can to, to gain citizen input on what the needs of the community are. Um, and I just wanted to provide some bullet points here just to give you an idea of what has happened to date uh, re relative to gaining citizen input uh, for our five-year consolidated plan. Uh, through November uh, 2020 up till February of 2021, we, we did conduct a, a paper and online survey that was made available. Uh, we were able to obtain 169 respond, uh, responses on that survey. Um, I know for within a community of 90,000, that's that's not a huge number, but frankly, 169 I think is a pretty good number when we when we do these plans throughout the country. I think uh, I think that 169 is actually pretty good. Uh, we're not really looking here to be scientifically uh, valid. We're just looking to gain as input from as many people as possible. So. I thought 169 was uh, was a good number to gain input from, and we did conduct that through um, SurveyMonkey. There will be a uh, survey summary provided uh, in the in the plan within the appendix, so you'll be free to peruse that information, and it, it is pretty detailed, so you can see how everyone responded and what they felt like high, the greatest needs are within the community. Um, no shocker, uh, at quick glance, you'll notice that roads are 
generally the number one that that people feel are the need, the greatest need. Uh, and that was no different than it was in 2016. Uh, roads, roads, roads. Um, just a little background on me. I live in Plymouth Township. Even though I work all over the country, I do live just north of Joy Road. So I, I know that the uh, township has passed a millage recently. I know they have been uh, working to improve some of the roads and I commend the community for doing that. And I can already see some, some good improvements there. But nonetheless, our, our, our citizens feel that's still important. Uh, we also conduct, conduct community meetings. We've met with our citizen advisory board as, as we will again uh, with them uh, and conduct public hearings with them and gain their input relative to the five-year consolidated plan and the expenditure of CDBG funding. They will make a recommendation to the township board before any final uh, plans are submitted to HUD. So the, the final authority does reside with the township board. Uh, and I'll, finally, our 36 public, 36, I'm sorry, 30 day public comment period, which will uh, be just around the corner here in early April. We're intending to conduct a, a 30 day public comment period consistent with HUD requirements where the plan will be made available for review and public comment. So feel free to access that on the Canton Township website. And I'm, I'm sure that our good friends in the finance and budget department would provide a hard copy if we needed one to review. Uh, but again, it is an extensive document, so I would I would recommend if you could get a digital copy, that's probably your best option uh, to save a, a couple trees in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, our schedule, I, I've provided some background on our schedule here and where things are going to be moving forward. Um, you know, we've kind of gone through our public outreach efforts here through November, uh, Jan November through uh, through March. Uh, we're we're now kind of getting to the draft form. Of the, of the consolidated plan and annual action plan. And, and then uh, through the 30 day public comment period, it's more of a waiting period. We wait to see if we get any input from, from the community. Uh, and th that can be in writing, it can be by phone. Um, however, folks feel that best uh, to provide comment. And then finally in May, we hope to come back to the board for uh, approval of the five year consolidated plan, submit that plan by mid May. In, in hopes that HUD will give us their blessing and everything will be able to move forward on June, July 1 when our fiscal year begins. So that's a quick 15, 20 minute summary of, our, of CDBG. And uh, trust me, there is a lot more to these programs, but uh, I wanted to provide you with the basics, uh, you know, as we move forward through this process and as these plans are presented to you uh, for, for, to make decisions. I think it's helpful to have these basics uh, in your head and, and, and thinking about these. Um, but I'll open it up now to any discussion, questions, comments that anyone has specific to my presentation or, or the process. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Hi, Jason. Um, thank you so much. This was really informative. I'm wondering for um, the special needs population, how is how is the information um, about them accessed? Like, is that through the census or um, American Community Survey? I'm just wondering how they're identified. Yeah, so in a couple of ways, uh, the American Community Survey does provide. Um, well, let me, let me differentiate between the U.S. Census and the American Community Survey. The American Community Survey is you know, part of the U.S. Census, uh, but you, know, you remember in 2010 when we, we got our short form U.S. Census forms, it really only asked you eight questions, none of which were specific to do you have a disability, you know, are you a senior citizen, things of that nature. Uh, the American Community Survey is what provides us with that more detailed snapshot of the population. So the bulk of the information that we get is from the American Community Survey, and the most recent that is available is from 2019. So that's pretty pretty recent, um, and we can get information on uh, people who identify as having a disability. You can get inf uh, information on, on your population based on age. Um, you know, a whole host of other info. Now it doesn't provide us everything we need, but it does provide uh, provide us with some good information. Uh, in addition, the HUD through their what what uh, a system that uh, Mike uses internally for for tracking uh, in in preparing plans is uh, 
in IDIS, it's uh, a system that we will end up ultimately uploading our consolidated plan into and submitting to HUD. But there is a resource within that system, and that'll that'll be within that'll all be outlined within the plan itself. Uh, and it's called Chas Data C H A S. That's a, a comprehensive housing affordability strategy, I believe, is what it's called. It's a HUD provided data source uh, that also provides us with some additional information uh, on special needs populations. That's mostly focused on housing, uh, people who have housing problems, cost burdens, things of that nature. And then finally, uh, getting information from uh, local service agencies, our continuum of care uh, is also an option for us, but that's generally specifically focusing on homeless populations. Um, so we, we go through uh, this extensive research to, to try to gain, in, gain information on, on the populations on, on many different levels. <laughs> so those are generally the three main resources that we use to get information about special needs populations. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anyone else? I don't, just to let everybody know, I don't see any other hands. Wendy, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, just real quick, um, I think, the majority of the board's aware that uh, we were awarded two, in addition to our annual CDBG award, um, two additional awards specifically related to COVID. Uh, the first one was for $215,000, which um, there was a plan, the majority, and uh, Jason spoke on this, the majority of that was to go towards rental assistance. We still have um, the second award that we received for COVID related. I believe is about $348,000 uh, that has to be spent specifically for COVID related items. Um, Jason, would you mind touching on what you know other communities have been successful on as far as spending those um, COVID dollars and what has worked in other communities? Yeah, no problem. Thanks. So, so I will say that uh, with, with all communities that it's been a slow go with this new CARES Act funding is you know, trying to figure out what activities are of uh, greatest need. You know, it's, I don't believe any of, any of us have lived through a pandemic before, nor did we know uh, what exactly we should be focusing our resources on. But um, the bulk of the communities that I've worked with, and this is in five different states now, uh, the rental and mortgage assistance and utility assistance is one big one that, that I think has been one of the more, more successful programs. Um, you know, individuals that have uh, become unemployed due to uh, COVID-19 are, you know, are, are hurting. And, you know, I know that there's a lot of funding coming from the federal level through unemployment and, and stimulus, but, you know, paying, paying the mortgage and paying rent, keep, 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 keeping people housed is really important. Um, also keeping people fed. Uh, so food banks have also been a real common, uh, a common um, program that's been funded. I, I've noted. I've, I've talked to a couple individuals that actually work for food banks, and they've seen a, a large uptick in uh, in need there. So uh, they're in need of additional resources. Um, other activities include uh, communities are now being uh, exposed to all of these new expenses specific to COVID nineteen expenses that maybe you didn't account for in your budget. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier about that urgent need category, you know, if you, if any, any program that you fund needs to meet a CDBG goal and under that urgent need category, there's a, there's a potential for things like PPE uh, for your community and um, COVID related expenses that your community is incurring that could fall under that, that category. Um, so I know there's no shortage of uh, communities that are, um, you know, looking for, for different resources to help fund some of these different uh, expenses that they're starting to uh, incur. Uh, specific to COVID. Uh, homeless services is also another, you know, the homeless population has, has increased, I think, in a lot of places. So uh, homeless service providers are looking for additional resources to help fund programs uh, for individuals that have, have become homeless due to COVID-19. Um, one other is, you know, business assistance. And I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't, I haven't heard of, a, I, of all the communities I work with, I've, I've heard them uh, 
actually have issues with with funding this program with CDBG, although it's obviously a great need, especially with local uh, lo local businesses and, and and that within our communities. But um, you know, business assistance is eligible uh, and eligible expense as well. But the, the trouble they've been having is businesses don't want to deal with paperwork with all the federal paperwork that they gotta they have to do associated with CDBG. And it's all it also becomes difficult to um, to qualify a business as a you know, benefiting primarily low and moderate income populations too. So uh, that becomes a, a, a tough uh, a tough thing to uh, to justify, but um, but nonetheless, it is an important um, program and it is certainly is a, is a need within many communities. Uh, I think that, that's the bulk of the programs I've seen. I, you know, one, one neat one I could say uh, that was not, not a lot of communities have done that I thought was, was interesting. Uh, community in Texas that I've worked with, they're, they're funding a boys and girls club to help that facility improve their technology and internet connection uh, within the, the facility. Facility The facility does serve a, a larger number of lower, lower and moderate income uh, children uh, that maybe don't have uh, access at home. Um, obviously, they've been doing virtual learning. Uh, and when you don't have good internet connection at home, it's really difficult to be able to uh, go about your daily, uh, your school day. Um, and maybe they don't even have, maybe they don't have a laptop or a, an iPad or a Chromebook. I mean, not everyone's as fortunate as the Plymouth Canton district where they're able to provide uh, devices for, for their children that need it. So, so I thought that was a, a unique uh, program also. So a lot of different ways, a lot of different communities have a lot of different needs, but, but I, I have always fallen back on keeping businesses in business keeping people housed and keeping people fed. Um, and then there is that one, there's one final one, but I, I don't, I haven't seen a lot of communities do it. Um, you can fund uh, COVID testing, um, you know, provide uh, funding to help set up mobile clinics, things of that nature. Um, I haven't seen a lot of communities that I work with go about doing that uh, with their CDBG funding. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of additional funding out there to, uh, for the, purposes of, of medical services. So uh, the CDBG funding within the community that I work with hasn't really been fully, hasn't been largely allocated towards that type of uh, program. Would that have to only benefit the senior or low to moderate or because of the pandemic, does it qualify for anybody like setting up a clinic or testing site? Can it be for any? Yeah. So, um, Yes, to both of those questions. I, I guess I, you know this is when we get into like the the nuts and bolts of the CDBG program. And so, you know, I mentioned that urgent need national objective earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so, seventy percent of your CDBG money is required to benefit low and moderate income populations. Thirty percent of it can fall under that urgent need category. The urgent need category technically doesn't have to meet that low and moderate income requirement. So that's only 30% though. So the remaining funding that you utilize though would all need to go towards benefiting low and moderate income individuals or households. Okay, thank you, Jason. You're welcome. Jason, you had mentioned something about legal assistance also. What kind of legal assistance this fund? Yeah, so this can be uh, through, generally through a, a nonprofit. Um, legal assistance can be a lot of different things, but generally speaking, it is uh, providing legal assistance for seniors or low and moderate income households. Uh, if folks are having um, foreclosure issues, uh, if they're having, um, you know, they could provide will assistance for seniors. Um, they could provide, um, Gosh, I'm going blank here. Mike, I, I don't know what you guys do specifically in Canton with legal services, but these are like the couple that I've seen. Um, other, uh, you know, property, legal services, things of that nature, uh, that, that senior, it's usually focused on seniors. And then the other legal service that I've, I've seen is uh, individuals that have had uh, fair housing, um, a fair housing complaint. Uh, so if they, they feel like they're being discriminated against uh, based on their religion or national origin or race, ethnicity, uh, gender, uh, then they, that's another uh, type of legal assistance that, that may be available to them. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? Quick question. Um, can, 
can any of the funds be used for child care? Because I know um, during the pandemic, folks were having issues with um, child care, um, especially when the schools were closed. Um, so I just wondered if any of the funds could be used to supplement families with that, especially the low income families. Yes, the, the quick answer to that is yes. Um, child care services is, is generally a, a, an activity that would be uh, an eligible activity, but the, the key to that is uh, you know, the, the folks receiving assistance would need to be low and moderate income. Um, and that does become the responsibility of whoever's administering that program. So those, those folks that are utilizing that child, child care would need to provide income, to, income information uh, in order to, to utilize the services. Um, sometimes that's the responsibility of a, of a nonprofit group. Maybe, maybe the township were to team with a, uh, a public service agency, a nonprofit group that provides a service that, of that nature. And then the township just kind of becomes the, the source of funding. Um, and then that, that uh, nonprofit would be responsible to collect income data to ensure that the, low and mod the population being served is low and moderate income. Yeah, we've been working with, what was it Wayne Metro um, for the mortgage and rental assistance? Um, program. Yeah, we at Wayne Metro, they've been around a long time. They know they know the, the ins and outs of these programs. So that's a good uh, a good group to team with. Thank you. Thanks. How, can, how about um, tutoring services or even you talk about business assistance? How could uh, who would qualify? You know, would it be for PPE or what if you could elaborate on both of those? Yeah, yeah, so um, tutoring uh, would that could potentially qualify again. Um, that would be I, I'm making the assumption that it would be tutoring for uh, for the youth and the youth being uh, being provide accessing that service would again need to be a low and moderate income household. Um, you know, you mentioned in business assistance, uh, you know, that's that's a bigger explanation that's that could be a lot of different things um so you know business assistance could be anything from facade improvements to to physical buildings to uh providing micro enterprise loans to small businesses you know five five people or less is, a, is considered a micro enterprise um job training uh, again all these need to be low and moderate income households or businesses um so the, those are just a, a few different ideas, um, but those are the ones I see most commonly commonly funded um, are the job training, uh, facade improvements, and uh, and the micro enterprise loans. Thank you, appreciate it, Tanya. Yeah, so this question is specifically for Wendy for the two um, funds that you received, the awards that you received. Um, was that mostly used for? that you said the first one was mostly used for COVID like rental assistant, rental and mortgage assistant. Uh, the second one that you said was for 348,000. Has that been used for any other purposes or that's still been used that's, for that's the one we, we still need to um, bring forth before the CDBG advisory council and the township board to make a, well, they would make a recommendation to the township board of how to allocate those dollars. So. Um, the 348 has not yet been allocated. Um, and I have a quick question for Jason about the businesses. Is this like, is that for the businesses, is it um, equally ex extensive applications for just, you know, applying for things like PPE or like they, in this pandemic situation or is, is, is it an elaborate process, as you said, or because they have to fill up all the papers? Well, if you just- it easier? If you so so is the question is is it an elaborate process to just provide PPE to businesses? Yeah, no, I'm just saying if they wanted any, like any type of assistance, is it a similar process that they have to follow for a, a, a application for assistance? Because in the pandemic situation, it's you know um, people started off mostly businesses started off mostly by applying for PPE. Was that was was is this also a more extensive process? Uh, because that is the additional cost a lot of businesses are incurring during this pandemic. Yeah, 
Um, so the, the funding things like PPE for businesses, I, I would say, is a is a less complicated process than providing like business loans <laughs> or you know things of that nature. I, I'll tell you right now. Uh, I'm just going to be upfront and frank with you. Funding a business assistance program with CDBG is difficult. Okay. Um, keeping it simple, uh, like just providing, making PPE available to those who, who want it, that's that's a much smaller uh, uh, smaller endeavor to, to embark upon. Um, but when you start providing business loans, um, then you have to go through a whole other, you know, economic development generally CDBG is an extensive process. I'll just, put it, I'll just kind of summarize it in that nature, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, anyone else? Anyone on Wendy's team, Mike or? No, I just wanted to thank Jason for all of his hard work. Uh, when the pandemic and COVID came uh, last year, uh, HUD threw money at us and uh, there was a lot of non-information. There wasn't a lot coming from HUD. So Jason was a resource a lot of cities in Michigan and around the country went to. And so we all kind of shared our plans and policies and stuff on email and Way Trim was uh, tremendously helpful. Thank you, Carolyn. Oh, you're on mute, sorry. You're on mute still. Uh oh. <laughs> oh no, you can't unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, can you? Okay, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah, Hit the, uh, we use Jason as a resource on this. Um, you know, it, it is complicated, the rules for that um, HUD put forth for using this money. And not only were they um, at, at first non-existent, when we did get some direction, later on, they, the rules changed. <laughs> so uh, we kind of had to uh, constantly be monitoring what's the latest uh, interpretation of the rules. So anyway, um, it's, uh, we're grateful for the money and we're grateful for the good that we can do for the community with it, so. Great, thank you. I, and I would and I would just like to thank Carolyn, Mike, and Jason. You know, it was kind of a undaunting task to try to to try to work through all the grants that we received. And like Carolyn said, the first, you know, we'd have a webinar from one per, from one group that would say you could use it on this, and then the next week you'd have a webinar from another group that would completely contradict what the first one said, and you weren't sure who was on first. So it was it was a difficult task in the beginning. So I appreciate their hard work and. Um, Jason's help with that as well. It, it wasn't easy, but but we're getting through it. So all for good cause. So thanks to everybody for their help on this. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, team. All right, thank you. Our next item on the agenda is the presentation of the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, a new dist redistricting uh, process. And I will escalate Commissioner Rebecca Sisetla. Let me do that now. Hello, Commissioner. Hi, how are you? Fine, Everyone? how are you? Good, I'm glad you can hear me. Is it possible for me to share my screen? Definitely. I'm not seeing the button to do it. Okay, let me try. Uh... I promoted her to panelist. I think you have to be a panelist in order to share screen. She was a participant. So maybe see if it appears now. There you go. Thank you. I got unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. When that transition happened, I ended up getting muted too. So let me see. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, uh, so my name is Rebecca Zatella. I am serving as a member of the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, known as the MICRC. I am a resident of Canton. Um, I want to recognize, um, first of all, Township Supervisor Graham Huddock and the Board of Trustees for providing me with the opportunity to speak. I would also like to thank Amy Hughes, Hughes I'm sorry, I'm going to kill her name, Hughes Dunn, <laughs> excuse me, for coordinating my presentation tonight. 
So the history of the MICRC is that in 2018, <clears throat> Michigan voters passed Proposal 2, which was a ballot initiative for the voters, not the legislators, to take responsibility for nonpartisan redistricting. <clears throat> and that created the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. The Districting Commission is comprised of 13 randomly selected Michigan residents. It includes four Democrats, five independents, and four Republicans. The MICRC is responsible for redistricting the U.S. Congressional, Michigan House, and the Michigan Senate districts. Before we're allowed to start drafting our plans, um, we have to have at least 10 public hearings throughout Michigan. Um, we recently had meetings on this and we decided that we're gonna go a little bit more than that. So we're actually planning on having 16 public meetings to start out with. Um, before we start drawing our plans. And in terms of Canton and what's relevant to Canton, we will be having one on June 8th in Novi and one on June 10th in Dearborn. So those would probably be the closest for people who reside in Canton who wanna provide public out input. The purpose of the public meetings is for us to inform the public about the redistricting process to share the purposes and the responsibilities of the commission, and most importantly for us to solicit information from the public about potential redistricting plans. Um, we are actively looking for people to tell us where they think lines should be drawn, where they think lines shouldn't be, be drawn, if there's communities of interest in the area. Um, we're hoping that people will help us identify those because those come into play with our maps. So that is the type of information that we are looking for. Um, in conclusion, um, if any members of the community are interested in sending us that feedback, they can email us at the email address here. They can attend one of our public meetings. Um, we're also planning on having town halls in addition to the primary public meetings. The distinction there being um, the primary public meeting is gonna be the entire commission of 13 people. The town halls are our thought process on that is that we'll have maybe two or three commissioners meet in smaller locations so that we can have more contact with the public and get more information from different areas. Um, because I live in Canton, obviously I'm gonna be pushing that we have a town hall in Canton because that's nice and convenient for me <laughs> as well as uh, get information for our community. So thank you very much for providing me with this opportunity to speak. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, any questions? There's my video. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started talking and I had my screen share going, so I'm like, well, I'm just not going to mess with it for now. But there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions from anyone? I'll ask one. Thanks Stephen. for presenting. Um, uh, how were the uh, commissioners chosen? It was random. So um, you could have filled out an application to be on the commission, and then you had to designate whether you were Democratic, Independent, or Republican. And then there were also people who the Secretary of State randomly selected as well and added to the pool. I believe there were almost um, 10,000 people who had applied or who were selected randomly by the Secretary of State. Then based on that, they did a preliminary lottery and narrowed the pool down to, I believe it was 200 people. Um, and then both the Republican and the Democratic Party were basically given a number of strikes like you would have in a trial um, where they could strike certain individuals. Um, once that process <clears throat> passed through, then there was a second lottery to pick the initial 13. So out of that initial 13, we had two people who resigned. Um, I was selected after the second person resigned. Oh, okay, great. Yep. Um, so, so there was some due diligence, bringing the parties in to ensure that people saying they were Republican were Republican, people saying they were Democrat were Democrat, but in, they only had so much power to ensure that those people were removed from the process if they weren't. Right. So the, the constitutional amendment itself sort of weeds out people who have um, Democratic or Republican ties. So if you had previously run for office, or maybe you had a family member who ran for office within a certain time period, you would be excluded from applying. Um, and there were a couple other criteria. I, I can't list them off off the top of my head, but there were criteria that sort of limited the pool so that you don't have people who were highly partisan and involved in the political process applying in the first place. <clears throat> from that point, I believe it was really just a certification of you declare what you are. I don't know that there was any sort of vetting process to determine, um, you know, are you really <laughs> Democratic, Republican, or Independent? But, um, you know, like anything in, in life, it's 
there's a certification process where you sign something saying that this is true and accurate, just like you would if you were going to sit on a jury. I'm a lawyer, so I think of everything in legal terms. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so it's kind of the same process that people people signed a declaration stating that their answers were truthful and honest. So. And last question is, how have the meetings been going? They've been going well. Um, it, it's a little awkward with everything being on Zoom with all of us meeting for the first time at first, but I feel like we have a pretty good rhythm now and we're moving through things and making progress. And, you know, we've hired some staff, we've, you know, approved some for some meetings to be scheduled. And I think we're moving along. Um, I think we're going to have some significant challenges with the timing of the census, but we're doing our best to address that in the best way that we can. Thank you. Michael? Um, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. I, um, I, I had the, the honor of zooming into one of your sessions and watching. Um, there was some, some heated discussion over um, the powers granted to the chair uh, during meetings and how you would handle ruling people in and out of order and things like that. It was interesting to watch. Yeah. Of a pretty diverse and um, definitely non, kind of like non-partisan, non-political professional group of people um, kind of go over those rules. It was really, I was like in the, I'm watching like, uh, like yelling at my computer screen. Kind of like, <laughs> no, you want to, you want the chair to be able to do that. People will get crazy. Um, yeah. Um, so I was kind of curious how that ended up. Did you end up giving the, uh, the chair the ability to regulate debate or how that yes. Yes, the chair does have that ability, and we do have a code of conduct at this point as well, um, and some bylaws that govern that as well. If someone's being, you know, rude, abusive, defamatory, we can stop them from speaking, and so on and so forth. So, very good. Yeah. As I'm sure, as I'm sure you're aware, whenever you have public meetings, um, sometimes things can go off the rails when you have people commenting publicly. <laughs> so mm-hmm. people can get very emotional, and um, you know, yeah. So. Well, and, and your body by its very nature is, is stripping away a substantial amount of power from both political parties. And someone once said to the partisan, the nonpartisan appears partisan. And I think there's nothing more true than an independent redistricting commission. Watching both political parties, I'm a member of one, freak out over having little to no control over this process has been really fun to watch. Um, I'll just put that out there. And then the second portion, my other question is, yeah, so are you, are you getting an indication that you'll get the numbers in earlier than before? I know the state constitution, I thought, required that you have uh, essentially present a plan prior, uh, it was a prior to certification. I think certification date is the 1st of November, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So I know initially they were not going to get the census information until September, which would put you in violation of, of the requirements. Had you, I believe there was that you were going to ask the Supreme Court to enter to the, the Secretary of State was going to ask the Supreme Court to get involved. What, what's the status on that kind of? So that's exactly right. Uh, we have to have the plans approved by November 1st. Uh, we have a mandatory 45 day comment period before those plans can be approved. So that would put us at about September 14th, um, where we'd have to have plans out there to the public. We're not getting census information until September 30th at this point. So it creates a very um, challenging logistical problem for us. So we're sort of approaching it on two fronts. Um, I should say three three fronts. One is we're hoping and praying the Census Bureau is, is going to get their act together. And um, hopefully with you know a new administration, maybe we can um, have them be provided with the resources that they need to complete the work. Because from what I understand, it's, it's a manpower issue. And maybe if they have additional manpower and there's some intervention there because it it doesn't just affect Michigan, it affects every state. And so there's a lot of political pressure. Um, So there's sort of the hope and prayer that maybe things will be sooner than September 30th and that that's not gonna be the date we're gonna get it. The second is we are proceeding with a case in front of the Michigan Supreme Court where we are asking for the Supreme Court to um, rule on that issue of, can we have more time? Do we have more time? You know, what is the appropriate response? Because we, we, can definitively say if if we get that data on September 30th, we cannot meet the deadlines that have been dictated to us. Um, and then sort of the third is is the backside of, of hoping that politically there can be some pressure to change some things at the Census Bureau and speed things up as well. So interesting. Interesting. Thank Summer. You. Go ahead, Summer. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation today. This is actually the second presentation that I've sat through today um, on the (laughs) Independent Redistricting Commission. Um, 
I think his name was MC Rothhorn. Yes. Um, he yes. was the commissioner. He, he gave a, a presentation to us today at work. Um, so I'm very happy to hear out and about speaking to communities um, about this um, and getting people more involved in the process because whatever the product that you come up with at the end is going to impact our communities for the next 10 years. So I would love to see more people get involved in paying attention um, to the good work that the commission is doing. So I just wanted to thank you for being here and to thank your fellow commissioners for um, being out and about and talking to thank you. Um, various community groups. Thank you. Thank you, any other questions? So thank you, Commissioner. I was gonna ask you, so is it still, the ruling is still about approximately looking at a size of district of 90,000 people? Is that still the rule of thumb or? Well, um, everyone is expecting that US Congressional is gonna lose one. We're gonna go from 14 to 13 and then that's gonna <clears throat> sort of filter down to everything else. So um, I think 90 will probably be pretty close, but it, it depends on what those final census numbers are. We are planning in the meantime to look at, I noticed your last speaker was talking about the American Community Survey as well. We're looking at that over the summer to sort of help us get an idea of maybe where lines might be drawn in advance of the census with the hope that we'll be more prepared when that data finally comes in. But um, yeah, I think 90 for the smaller districts is going to going to be the number. I think it's like 700,000 for the U.S. Congressional and then it goes on down from there. So. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much for the great presentation and I'm sorry about last time. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I just, it was funny because I, you guys were having technical issues and then, the, you know, there was just a lot going on. I understand. So no worries. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if we have any other, um, let us know when the you know, the next presentations are in terms of the community. We'd like to, we can publicize it, help publicize it. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. The next item on the agenda is public comment. So public comment, just to let you know, is three minutes. And if you would um, raise your hand as an attendee and identify yourself, if you are on a phone, although I don't see any phones, if you're on a phone, you could dial star six, but are there any, is there anyone, any attendee that wants to raise their hand? Okay, so again, um, please identify yourself and where you live and uh, you can just say the township or city and um, it's three minutes. So I see, oops, a hand just dropped. Where did they go? There was a hand up and it dropped. It was somebody seeing me. They seem to have dropped off. Um, anyone else for public comment? Okay, Sandra. Okay, so here, hang on a second. Okay, Sandra, if you can unmute, you can go ahead and talk. Good evening, I'm Sandra Miller and I'm a resident of uh, Grandview Estates. So this is actually, I wasn't clear. Um, I'm here reference Grandview South. Is this the appropriate time for a public comment? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, it should be about the specific item on the agenda, correct? We have an item on the agenda for granted. Yes, it's for your. Uh, it's up for your final approval. Okay. So yeah. probably it's appropriate to have it during that agenda item. Well, it's not a public hearing, so she can speak now if she'd like. Okay. Well, we, okay. we do call this citizen non-agenda item comments in our board rules um, under. Under our policies. Okay, just as public comments on the agenda. Um, okay, well, I can, I can wait. Okay. Pardon? Yeah, if you want to let her talk now and then she get at home, that that would be that would be appropriate. But so the board approved rules indicate that for this section, we have a forum called Citizens Non Agenda Item Comment, where an individual can speak about the consent calendar. And because there's no debate on a consent calendar and they can speak about any item that's not currently on the agenda. Okay, uh, I can wait rather than set a precedent. <laughs> okay. You could do either. Thank okay, you. I'll wait. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Yes. Oh, how do, I, how do I mute? I will, I can help you. Okay, um, the next person is Ace Badoon. Is this a non-agenda item? We can um, go down the agenda and ask you later during agenda items. 
Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, not sure. I believe it's on the agenda in regards to the car wash being built on uh, Michigan and Canton Center. Okay, we do have that as an item, so you can speak during that time. Okay, when's that coming up pretty soon? Let me see. Yes, it's um, on the general calendar, the second item. Second item, okay. Mm -hmm. So about a half hour or so, hopefully? Yes, sure. All we'll, right. we'll, have, we'll strive for it. I'll wait till then, then. Thanks. Okay. Thank and you. Then we, sure, thank you. And we have, there's Sammy again. Sammy, is this on something that's on the agenda? Yep, you just kind of answered my question, what Ace just asked, so I'll wait. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other residents with non-agenda items? Let me see, I don't see any hands. Um, anyone hitting star six? Okay, great. No more hands, thank you. So you can um, raise your hands during the public comment section of each item. The next item, can I have a motion to pay the bills? Madam Supervisor, I make a motion that we pay the bills. Thank you. Clerk Seekers, can you please take roll call to pay the bills? Warninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Linguli. Aye. Graham Hudak. Aye. Seegerstein, Slavens. Aye. Snyderman. Aye. Motion passes. The next item is a resolution. I didn't know Wendy brought this um, to our to our forum today. Wendy, did you want to read the resolution that um, declaring April is Fair Housing Month in Canton? No? No, nope. okay. you go right ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Wendy brought this to us and it's a resolution declaring the month of April as Fair Housing Month in Canton Township. Whereas the year 2021 marks the 53rd anniversary of the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 is amended and Whereas this law guarantees that housing throughout the United States should be made available to all citizens without regard to race, color, religion, sex, family status, disability, or national origin, and whereas equality of opportunity for all is a fundamental policy of this nation, state, and township, and whereas barriers which diminish the rights and limit the option of any citizen will ultimately diminish the rights of all citizens. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Charter Township of Canton Board of Trustees designates the month of April 2021 as Fair Housing Month in Canton Township. We encourage the residents of our community to join in this observance. So moved. So moved. Clerk. Clerk Seekers, please take roll call. Warninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Inguli. Aye. Jim Hudak. Aye. Seekers, aye. Slavens. Aye. Snyderman. Aye. Thank you, motion passes. Can I have a motion does, to, um, actually, does anyone have any public comment on the consent calendar? Any of our attendees have any comment on the consent calendar, which is the next agenda item? Don't see any hands. Can I have a motion to, on the consent calendar? And Supervisor, I move the board approve the consent calendar as presented. Items C1, consider approval of an extension of the contract with ARC Document Solutions. Item C2, consider approval of annual maintenance and technical support agreement for uh, CityWorks asset management software. Item C3, consider 2021 meeting dates for the Commission for Culture, Arts, and Heritage. Item C4, consider approval of budget amendments to close at fund 276 neighborhood stabilization program. And finally, item C5, consider the purchase of 15 Taser X26P units and accessories. Support. Thank you. Any questions or discussions? Clerk Segrist, please take roll call on the motion. Warninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Inguli. Aye. Van Hudak. Aye. Segrist, aye. Slavens. Aye. Schneiderman. Aye. This motion passes. Um, do we have Kristen Kolb? Sometimes she gets put as an attendee. Let me just check for the next item. Okay, I don't see Kristen. 
All right, the next item is um, item G1 under the general calendar. Consideration of first reading of an ordinance amending chapter 70 of the Canton Code of Ordinances, section 70-6, stopping, standing, or parking. Madam Supervisor, I move that uh, to, I move to introduce for first reading an ordinance amending chapter 70, section 70-6, stopping, standing, or parking, and to table for consideration the proposed ordinance amendment um, to schedule to a scheduled second reading, April 13, 2021. Court. Thank you. The Township Prosecuting Attorney Greg Demopoulos has requested an amendment to Section 70-6 of the Canton Code of Ordinances entitled Stopping, Standing, or Parking. Currently, if a defendant has been issued a speeding ticket for the first time or after a period of time with no infractions, they are offered a reduction to a charge of impeding traffic, which results in zero points being abstracted to their driving record. However, because this is a state law change, Canton receives no fees for this ticket upon a plea of responsible. By amending section 70-6 as proposed and making a violation of civil infraction, the person pleading responsible still receives zero points on their driving record. However, as this is a township ordinance violence, violation, Canton would receive a portion of the fees paid. Um, Chad, would you like to speak to that a little bit? I don't know. Certainly, uh, certainly. I think it's important to give tools for the prosecutor, especially um, to help really define how we approach procedural justice today, number one. And number two, um, the police department, I have to be clear, we don't receive funding back um, directly from citations. So it's good for the public to hear that, but they also need to know this will provide a mechanism for the, the township um, to help fund the cost of the court activities. So hopefully that's a little bit helpful and then, you know, there'll be a second reading if there's any more questions, but it's important to understand, you know, procedural justice, number one, from our standpoint, and number two, the township um, can receive some funding back that way. Right, thank you. Are there any questions? Summer? Just to, just to kind of go back to a point that um, Director Bob was just making, and I think this is important um, to explain a little bit further because I know that there's a lot of concern within communities of when people get stopped by police, that that money goes directly back to municipalities to fund those municipalities. And I know that is the case in, in some states, um, but it's not here um, in Michigan. And I know there have been a number of public consent judgment in different places because of those practices. So can you talk more about what I, I missed, I missed, if that was directed uh, for me, I missed part of it. The last Sorry, part. Sorry, can you talk more about can you talk more about um, how that, where that those funds go to and how they fund the court costs may, and not necessarily the communities? I may need a little bit of help from uh, finance director Trumbull on this, um, but I, I know our police department doesn't receive those funds directly back. I think it's important to uh, uh, understand that for each case filing, there's a cost to the court that the township has to pay for in allowing a tool like this for the prosecutor to um, offer, a, you know, a, a good uh, driving record and a violation like this to uh, bring a resolution to the case and give an opportunity um, for the their insurance rates not to go up. And the township also receives funding to actually fund the case. I don't know if Wendy can answer that question directly where the funding comes back from the court into the township. Yeah, um, the simplified answer is that the court revenues, you know, the court has their own set of expenses, you know, the people costs, the, you know, just their court operational costs, any um, fines and fees that come from tickets that can stay within the court system would be used to cover their own expenses. Um, if it's a state court, if it's a state fine, that money has to get sent to the state. So if it's money that stays with the court, that helps offset their costs. A uh, few, for years and years, if there was an excess at the end of the, the court's fiscal year, which is a calendar year also, um, if there's excess money, so some of those funds would be returned turned to each of the jurisdictions, each of the five jurisdictions that are part of the 35th district court. That, however, I think it was in 2018, 2019, 
Um, we stopped receiving um, checks back from the court at all um, because anything that was coming back to the communities instead of coming back to the communities, the board of the court um, authorized them to put those towards their legacy costs because their legacy costs um, funded status was so low. So it will help pay those. We don't get the money back at any more at this point in time until their legacy costs are paid back, but that will help offset their court, you know, their operational costs or legacy costs at the end of the day. Thank you. Apologies if I asked that question very clumsily. <laughs> clumsily. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's not an easy question to answer. If you want more detail, I'm happy to sit down with you and show you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Kate. Thanks. Um, so I have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, do we know of um, other communities in, in the surrounding area that, that, that do this already? We, we do. Uh, we do uh, also realize this is, um, some communities offer uh, typically double parking if anyone, you know, I know my family have been offered double parking in other communities, but it's, it's very hard to ethically offer that as a prosecutor to an individual if they're traveling in Canton when they've probably never even seen what double parking is, let alone commit the violation. Many people, you know, probably have committed this violation and it's easier for them to uh, uh, admit responsibility for something like this. Thank you. Um, and then my other question is, um, how would the, uh, how would it work for the ticket if um, it, would it still go through the court, but just come back to us or how, how are people gonna pay? Is, I guess my question. The uh, they would pay uh, traditionally at 35th District Court. I mean, there's no other way. I know there's some new legislation that when, when we're looking at misdemeanor offenses about uh, the ability for a defendant to pay, and even civil infractions, I believe. And there's new rules coming from Scale right now to address those, and it may actually go into place April 1st. There's a lot of new training on the police side. We're prepared for it you know, issuing the citations, but on the back end, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to help individuals that are not uh, in a position to pay for citations. Uh, so with, to answer your question directly, the, the driver would pay the court. Okay. They're admitting to the offense in front of the uh, magistrate or 35th district court judge, then they would go to the cashier directly after. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah. Um I think Summer kind of asked the question that I, I didn't understand, probably didn't understand the answer. Wendy, if you can, so now do they pay a fine um, and does like, do it, it doesn't come back to us or do they not pay a fine right now? It, so if, when people pay fines for whatever their ticket is for, or they pay the 35th district court, mm -hmm. depending on what the fine is for, this court either has to, um, submit reimbursement to the state of Michigan if it's a state of Michigan fine or they keep the revenue, um, the cash to cover their own costs. So they pay the court and then at the end of the year, um, you know, the court has excess funds that they collected more money, which um, really didn't happen in 2020 because the tickets went way down uh, at 2020. But if there's any excess at the end, they use it to pay down their legacy costs. And what, what is going to change right now? I mean, you um, like with this. What, what with this ordinance would change? Yeah. Um, if they plead down, and Chad, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if they plead down from this, from one fine, which is currently a state ticket, um, to this, which is revenue that would stay with the court, instead of the money being sent to the state, it would stay with the court. And it also benefits the um, person who is receiving the ticket because they would no longer receive points on their license and their insurance wouldn't go up. Okay, so it's still going to the court and the court has the discretion on how to spend that money or is it going to cover? Well, the court has a budget that they have to, you know, that they have to abide by. But yeah. if, if this changes, the money remains with the court instead of being legally required to send it to the state of Michigan. I think it's important too. Um, there's an oversight board for um, the 35th district court and that includes a finance committee if I'm, I, 
if I'm not mistaken. So they have a lot of oversight, you know, they have a, an administrator, they have a budget, and there's statistics to some degree that are maintained um, at the state level, and they're monitored by the uh, Michigan Supreme Court. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Clerk Seekers, can you please take a roll call on the motion? Kaninsky. Did we lose her? No. Nope. Oh. Just took me a moment. Hi. Gloucester. Hi. Anguli. Hi. From Hudak. Hi. Seekers, hi. Slavens. Hi. Oops, sorry. And Seidemann. Hi. Motion passes. Thank you. Item G2, consider approval of special land use for Canton Crossings Automobile Wash Establishment. Madam Supervisor, I move that the board approve the following resolution, the approval of the special land use for Canton Crossings Automobile Wash Establishment. Whereas project sponsors requested special land use approval for an automobile wash establishment use on the north side of Michigan Avenue, between Canton Center Road and Old Canton Center Road, and whereas the Planning Commission reviewed the request in the political criteria and voted 9-0 to recommend approval with conditions as the request meets the criteria of special land use approval in section 27.03C of the zoning ordinance. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Trustees of the Charter Township of Canton, Michigan does hereby approve the special land use request for an automobile wash establishment use on the parcel, tax parcel listed as the request meets the special land use criteria of the Canton Township Zoning Ordinance pursuant to the information and plans provided subject to specific design criteria to be addressed and corrected at the time of site plan review, including any required variances. Support. Thank you. The project sponsor proposes to construct an automobile wash establishment, uh, aka car wash, on the east side of the vacant portion of the subject parcel. As listed. The site is located between Canton Center Road and Old Canton Center Road, just north of Michigan Avenue, that is north of 7-Eleven and Comerica Bank. The site is zoned C3, regional, commercial, and automobile wash establishments are special land uses in the C3 zoning district subject to section 6.02D of the zoning ordinance. Although the plan shows multiple commercial buildings on the site, the special land use application is for car wash use only. Therefore, the other buildings shown on the plan are illustrative and the proposed site development will be considered on a future site plan review application. The project sponsor is in the process of preparing an application for the site plan review. And the special land use plans include far more details than are typically required on a special land use plan. Township staff is still working with the applicants on site plan revision, so the Planning Commission will review the site plan application at a future meeting if the special land use is approved. Additionally, if a fast food restaurant is proposed, it will be subject to a separate special land use application. It is a meeting on March 1st, 2021. The Planning Commission recommended approval of the special land use subject to conditions. Uh, Jade, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's pretty thorough. Um, and I think as it says, the site plan, uh, or the special land use has um, more specifics in it than what normally comes before you at this point. All right, thank you. So we're looking for public comment on this item. Um, and again, we'll give you three minutes and if you could raise your hands and identify yourself, I'll start with um, Steve George here. Okay, Steve. I think I muted myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Steve George, and I'm an attorney, and I represent Canton Center Car Wash. That's located at 5790 North Canton Center Road. And my address is, um, uh, I'm actually located in Dearborn. My office is in Dearborn, and I'm at Park Lane Towers, and that's Suite 729 East Tower in the Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, again, thank you for allowing me to speak today. I just wanted to address some of the concerns that my client has, and I think some other uh, individuals that I've talked to in the community, and it's with regard to the existing three car washes that are currently on Canton Center right now. There are three uh, right on Canton Center in, in the township. Uh, there's the Canton Auto Wash, there's the Quick Pass, which I believe is the, the same owners as the current applicant, and then there's the Canton Center, car, uh, I'm sorry, the um, uh, Kansas City Car Wash, which I, again, I represent. Uh, and this would be the fourth car wash on Canton Center within the, the township. And that's, and that's 
that's that's overly saturating uh, a business that's been extremely affected, uh, substantially affected in, in a negative way by COVID. And it just as a little bit of a backdrop, uh, car washes were not, and I represent a number of car washes, they were not essential businesses when originally businesses started to open up after everybody was shut down. And they, they, were, they were closed down for an extended period of time. And as you can imagine, when they were finally allowed to open up, nobody was driving and there was very little business or at least a significant drop in business because people were working remotely and there was less driving stands to reason there were less car washes. And now that there's a light at the end of the tunnel with COVID, what we're going to experience here and what my, my clients and specifically, you know, the clients in this area are, are experiencing is going to be an extended kind of concern and sort of like a, 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 like a long haul type effect of COVID because a lot of businesses are going to remain re working remotely and there's going to be a, you know, it, it, we don't know to what extent yet, but so, so there's going to be a, a drop um, at, at least now it's significant and hopefully it, 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 it uh, pairs down, but right now there is a significant drop in business. And it, and, and it's really, it, you know, and it's, I go back to something that Jason Smith said, he made a great, you know, great presentation when he was talking about the CDBG funding is it, you know, he said that, it really resonated businesses need, we need to keep businesses in business. And, and this is really part of what the community needs to do as a whole. We have existing business owners that sustained a significant hardship and now we're trying to sort of survive it all and introducing another, another car wash, it oversaturates this market. Uh, and it's really not necessary. Now, the same issue came up last Thursday in the city of Dearborn, and they, sh and they for the same reasons I'm bringing up today, and with the same considerations, they, they rejected a car wash that was attempting to open up across the street from another car wash, and, and they have approximately the same type of, uh, um, the same numbers within, this, within the same area, and, and they looked at the issue, and, and they chose to to, to make a commitment to the existing business, you know, business owners that really have stuck in there through COVID. And, and I think that, that I think that, that Canton would be in, in good shape to do the same with what they have right now with the businesses that are trying to survive this. You know, I, I, I'd, like, I'd like to make a couple of other observations too. And the, I don't know if um, you're familiar with this, but uh, these, these um, the owners of this particular location, they have another location over on, um, on Canton Center and uh, Hanford. And at that time, they, they applied, they made the representation to, I believe this body, to the, to the Board of Trustees, that they were going to um, uh, conduct a business that was a, a, a model that was membership only. And that was in large part because of some of the concerns that the residents had with some of the noises that would be created with some of the vacuums and some of the other concerns with the, the volume of traffic. At, at least that was my understanding. And so that model in large part was uh, taken in consideration when there was an approval of, of that particular location. In fact, my client, uh, in, in, to some degree, um, you know, was under the under the same understanding that that model was going to be employed and and didn't do anything to object to that that that, uh, that particular car wash opened up just down the street from him uh, it's it's really across the street and down the street from where he's located now they're not they're not applying that model to their particular location there just i just wanted to bring that up i thought that that i think that's relevant to these proceedings as well Great. and thank, uh, thank you mr oh, george thank okay, you thank you thank you okay uh, next we have um John Evancheck. Let me see. John Evancheck, you have um, three minutes, and you can please identify yourself and tell us where you're from. Sure. Uh, my name is John Evancheck. Actually, is how it's pronounced. Sorry. Um, I am here on behalf of Canton Auto Wash, uh, which is four five four two five Michigan Avenue. Uh, my office is actually located on Michigan Ave Avenue at four three six nine five Michigan Avenue. Um, it's not too far from my client's car wash and not very far from this proposed car wash. Um, just to kind of echo uh, what uh, the previous, um, uh, previous attorney, uh, Mr. George, uh, mentioned here, um, you're shoehorn, you're putting a lot of car washes in a very small part or very small area. Uh, the main concern here that my client has that I have um, and that I think the board should have is that you? There has been no traffic study done or even requested at this point. Um, the proposal, as was submitted to the Planning Commission, 
had a car wash that included a variance from the setback requirements and with the, not really an explanation as to why uh, somebody was being granted a setback variance on the uh, for a car wash and it more or less looked like they were doing it just so they could put three buildings on a parcel that probably can't support three buildings and there's we have no idea whether or not the roads or the traffic in that area uh, can support this uh, or it, it can can manage this additional traffic um, the proposed entry or ingress and egress points are off of one was off of Michigan Avenue going through the between the 7-Eleven the Comerica one was directly opposite um, the Kroger parking lot which I don't I'm sure you are familiar with or all are familiar with that parking lot is very very heavily trafficked um, and would result in a lot of left-hand turning into this parcel, um, which in and of itself is problematic. And the way that this is, the way that this, um, this proposal is being put forth is more or less piecemeal, where they're asking for the car wash to be approved, but clearly there's plans for at least one fast food. And it looks like from the plans that I reviewed this afternoon, uh, two potentially fast food or a drive-through, we'll call it, uh, buildings that are going to add a lot of traffic to the area between Gettys and Michigan Ave in an area where they're probably really, I don't think it can handle it uh, with what they're proposing here with this kind of, you know, this amount of uh, usage. I spoke to my client, um, Odell uh, LeCavier, um, he should be speaking a little bit later. His car wash does about 200 cars an hour uh, or more. Um, and you're gonna be putting that into this small location without any sort of traffic study and approving it without a traffic study or even requesting a traffic study. And then going down the road of, if this, they wanna come back and add fast food locations, you know, we're, then we're, we still haven't done a traffic study yet. So this is planning, not patchwork. And it feels like the way that this be, is being presented is patchwork, not planning or planning. So I would ask that the board would, uh, before moving forward with this, at least you know order a traffic study of the to see if the, this is even feasible in this location because it's entirely possible it's not, given especially where the entry and egress points are here, uh, and uh, you know the the plan specific, you know I, it, it's a very compact plan for a car wash um, that require that's proposing three abreast uh, traffic. Uh, control for cars, uh, as well as utilizing multiple alleyways um, that, right. yeah, so I'll, right. thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Banchek. Uh, next we have, let's see, Sammy L. Mazur. I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly. Sammy, you can go ahead. Hello, my name is Sammy L. Nasser. I live at 41756 Sanctuary Lane. Um, I actually live here, I work here, I play here, and it so happens I'm the vice uh, president of operations at Canton City Car Wash, which is located at 5790 North Canton Center. So, um, you know, the, a fourth car wash on Canton Center, I mean, it's, you know, there's, there's nothing really to justify a fourth car wash that's literally right the street from another one. It's almost to a sense of building two Home Depots on that corner right across the street from each other. And, you know, back in 2015, when these guys wanted to build Quick Pass Car Wash on Hanford and Canton Center, I went to uh, planning. And at the time, I don't know if Angela's still there or not. She worked under Jeff. That's who was the planning guy back then. And um, I remember Angela telling me, oh, don't worry about it. They're going to be just a membership only wash. Um, we've been in this business so long, there's nothing to say that I'm going to open my doors and the only people that can come through there are people with memberships. That There's no way around it. You're going to have to take cash. You're going to have to take credit. So they're basically just open to the public. Um, you know, like Steve George was saying, things are bad right now with the whole COVID situation. You know, the days are hit and miss. I mean, opening up a fourth car wash on the same road, I just, I just don't see a reason for that. So. Okay, no, thank you very much, Mr. Sammy. No problem, ma'am. Okay, now we have um, Ace, you're on now. Please Good evening, how are you guys doing? Hi, thank you. 
My name is Ahmad Beydoun. I'm actually a resident of uh, Canton, Michigan. I've lived in the city since 2007. I'm very happy living over here. Um, I'm also a business owner with ACES Four Seasons Lawn and Snow Care. I do maintain uh, a lot of properties in the, within the facility, uh, going from Black Rock to uh, multiple multiple you know, business areas in this area. I also service the, the school that's been opening up on Gettys, uh, just between Sheldon and uh, Canton Center Road. It used to be a church there, and I believe uh, Star International Academy has purchased that property, and they are opening a uh, school facility, and I'm in charge of maintaining that property. So I do drive along, you know, through the Michigan facility and whatnot, what I'm concerned about is like everybody else is saying, there are multiple car washes uh, up and down that road. Uh, and I believe there's about seven or eight car washes within this facility of uh, Canton itself, going from Joy Road and, um, good Lord, Joy Road and I believe um, um, Hicks, I believe. There's a car wash there. There's another two car washes on Canton Center, right across the street from each other. And there's another one on Michigan Avenue. I just don't see why would someone, why would anybody allow to open another car wash directly across the street from another wash. Um, I get it's competition and whatnot, but I just feel like it's too much in one area uh, for people to go to. Secondly, what I'm also concerned about is when people do pull out of the wash, um, and I believe it is on Michigan Avenue, if not correct, uh, this wash is being built. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe so, right? That's what we read. Right. Now, when cars do pull out of the wash and because I'm in the snow business, especially during winter winter uh, conditions. Um, roads do get slippery, and I believe uh, it is 50 or 55 miles per hour at the speed limit going down Michigan Avenue. Uh, I'm more concerned about uh, slippery conditions and roads uh, with uh, cars pulling out onto Michigan Avenue. Uh, water will run off onto the roads, and it will ice up quickly, uh, especially coming approaching Canton Center Road off of Michigan Avenue. Uh, it's very condensed there, and I believe it's two lanes, and there's, it is a turning lane, correct, uh, as well. Um, that could be safety as well, uh, considering that you guys are saying there, there's, I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's supposed to be a Kroger's or a Myers of some sort being opening up in that facility, in that open vacant land there. Um, there is a Home Depot there. There is a Walmart there. Uh, there's a completely, a lot, a lot, a lot of traffic going in, in between the area, and you guys are just creating another hazardous condition for people trying to pull into this car wash. Uh, let's say the guy does well, and let's say there's uh, cars being backed up onto the road. Um, how are you guys supposed to control that, especially with the amount of traffic that goes up and down that street? Um, I, the reason I experienced that, too, because there is a Tim Hortons on that corner as well. I've seen it several times where there's cars lined up onto Michigan Avenue, and I can't tell you how many car accidents or almost car accidents being happening uh, in that facility. Um, also, you guys got to consider with uh, the, what the lawyers are saying as far as uh, – uh, traffic uh, doing analysis how many cars go up and down the area you got to keep it accountable where when that school does open up it's going to create a lot more traffic going down Gettys and people leaving up down Canton Center Road which is going to create even more traffic um, and the reason why I know this is because I do do business with other schools and I can see how the cars get lined up and the lady that does own that school uh, they're very successful and very uh, they have a good uh, organization a good uh, schooling um, organization going on over there uh, so I can see a lot of people attending that school as well. All right. Uh, Th thank you very much. Thank you. It's not about the traffic, more than less. And there is a lot of competition there. And you guys did allow this guy to open up another car wash across the street from another, which oh. I don't see how you guys will allow people to do that. Just sit there, open up car washes and competition between another, especially during these rough times. I just thank think you. it's a call tour. Not thank fair. you, Mr. Boyden. Thank, thank you. Our last person is Mr. Odell Shavalier. Hope I didn't pronounce it correctly. Um, you can go ahead and speak. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I have the car wash across the street from the uh, uh, the opposed car wash that you're trying to build. And when I built that car wash, I was told that um, you recommended, even though it was only 125, but you recommended to have no water on the street whatsoever. So if, if and when, the winter comes, the water gets on the city streets and freezes, right? That you guys would not be responsible. Now, you made me build 289 feet from the road. That's how far you made me set back because at that point in time, there was a lawsuit in Wayne County about a person in another area 
that uh, exit the road uh, with water on it. And the Wayne County was not able to uh, keep the uh, salt on there. And the person did get killed. Now, I had no problem with that. I built this car wash knowing, uh, thought I was building this car wash, knowing that uh, nobody else would, could be able to build another car wash unless they were the same footage that I was. If you know where I'm at, I'm 289 feet off the road. Now, by the time that car leaves that car wash, 80% of the water, or maybe 90, is completely off the car, on the underbody, everywhere. So now, what I'm saying is this, with that, the way this, this looks, there's no way in, no way possible for him to keep the water off the, the city roads, no way. And c come winter, you are going to have ice on them roads and you are going to have an accident and somebody has to be responsible. So I'm just making it a point here that what's good for me should be good for him. Um, here's no way possible that he can keep that water off the road. I don't care what he says. Thank you. Thank and, you, Mr. One, one other thing, he's the same person that has a car wash at uh, Laban in Five Mile. When they tried to put a car wash at Haggerty and Five Mile in Laban, he went to the, the Northville Township and disputed it and won because he said there's too many car washes in the area. The same person that is asking for you to do the same thing. All right. Thank you, Mr. O'Dell. Thank you. Thank you. Our last one is that I can see is um, Dan DeClaire. Mr. LeClaire. I thank you, Madam Supervisor. Uh, my name is Dan LeClaire. I'm with Green Tech Engineering, I'm the civil engineering consultant for uh, Jamie Burke and Scott Griffin. Uh, they are the applicants. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Uh, we heard that there were, we were going to get some company tonight and I appreciate um, all the comments. A um, couple of things that we just wanted to state is we did, uh, we are here tonight for special land use. Um, this site will come back to the Township's Planning Commission for technical details with respect to all of the ordinances. Um, and we are, uh, we are fully comfortable and fully aware of uh, all the ordinances uh, with respect to this. Um, we did put a full plan together for you folks to see exactly what our intention is for the property, um, both now with phase one, which is the car wash, um, Mr. Scott Griffin the, is the owner of the property. He is probably going to do more infrastructure. He's getting uh, more excitement on this piece of property, which has been a complete challenge for him due to the shape and geometry of the property. Um, so we're excited about this. Um, appreciate the comments from uh, other car washes in the area and knowing that competition is good. I think uh, every bit of competition helps the residents of Canton Township. Um, so we're here tonight. I know Scott Griffin is on board as well tonight. Um, he may want to speak and we're happy to answer any questions that you folks may have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I, well, we have one more. Mr. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess I just wanted to respond to a few of the comments. Um, I, I apologize that, that you have been apparently put in the position of having to pick winners and losers of businesses um, rather than just approve sites. But uh, I, I get that nobody wants competition. Uh, I understand that, but it is America. And uh, new businesses start every day. Uh, because people think they can do something better or cheaper or more efficiently or whatever. And that's kind of what we think. The car wash industry has completely changed from 20 years ago. And I think uh, the one gentleman that spoke about being far from the road, that was 30 years ago. Uh, it has changed dramatically in the way the business is done. Uh, it's not a cash business. It's not a 60 foot tunnel anymore. It's, uh, it's a membership based business so that um, people can have a car wash near where they live, where they work, where their kids go to school, where they go to church. And so wherever you're at, if you have a car wash that's around it, then you can be a member of that car wash and it's very convenient for you wherever you're at. So this, is, this will be our fourth car wash for Quick Pass. 
and we're, we're doing more. And so the, the benefit is to the Canton residents and the Canton, Canton business owners because they can go to any of a multitude of locations with the same membership fee. And I think the first car wash that complained that's over four miles away from us and that it's, you know, there's a, a Home Depot across from us and a, and a Kroger and there are Home Depots and Krogers up at Ford Road, which are closer than that car wash. And Home Depot and Kroger typically have a 10 uh, mile radius between their stores, but here it's four. So they figure that there's plenty of business there and, and ours are over four. Uh, the, the second gentleman I think talked about, um, I can't remember exactly, but the, the, um, the part where it's, the water is gonna go on the road well, the way our design is, is that after the wash, they'll stay on the site and go past our uh, towel drying stations. So while they're drying the car, the car continues to drip and it's quite a time, not just a distance, but a, a period before they go out on the road. And when they do go on the road, it's not on the busier road, it's most likely Old Canton Center Road, or I, I, I call it Old Canton Center, but it's a Canton Center Road. So um, I don't think that the water will be issued. Plus we have drainage on site. We're, this is a, a $4 million investment and uh, it, it's gonna be the nicest car wash in the area. I think I submitted something to Patrick. I don't know if you've seen that about what the, the, the amount of business that's there for the car washes. I won't go into it if you have it, um, but we're available to answer any questions that, that you might have. Okay, thank you. I have. Um... <laughs> Let me see. So everyone has spoken at least once except for one person um, listed as Karen. So I don't know who Karen is. So if you want to speak, Karen, on about the car wash. Hi, my name is actually Carol Matthews and I live less than a mile from uh, Michigan Avenue. And I'm just a citizen here. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a car wash owner. But I have questions. The man that just spoke, four miles, no way. There is a car wash that's just across Michigan Avenue next to the BP. That is a mile. The car washes that are up at Ford Road, those are not more than three miles. And I would ask Mr. Seacrest, since he said that he brought this up, because a car wash meets the feasibility to build on a piece of property, is it really realistic? No, I mean, how many car washes do we need? The man says, oh, when you come out of church, you wanna go get your car washed. Okay, go across the street to Michigan Avenue, go up to Ford Road. You, you are gonna pass how many car washes? I mean, I would ask each of you, would you want four car washes on your main street? I live off of Canton Center and I can tell you between Palmer and Gettys, that road will need to get widened. I will tell you right outside that Kroger's, the gentleman that spoke about the water, that road all had to get re resurfaced because there was such terrible flooding there. And the road was just full of potholes, which we're all aware of. I mean, I don't think the community can sustain four car wash. I mean, look at Ford Road. You have three huge businesses going out, Love's, Bed Bath and Beyond, and J.C. Penney's, do you want to have these smaller businesses that are struggling to go through the same situation? I would say no. And, and then okay. somebody brought up, there's been no traffic study. Shame on you, Mr. Seacrest. You should not approve anything without having a traffic study. Thank you, Mr. Um, Supervisor, if I may, since I was by name, um, I want to let the community know who is watching that the board has a policy that the clerk, myself, reads every motion. It does not indicate support. So by bringing forward this motion, um, I was fulfilling my duty as clerk. Um, so right. I, I, I would like to say, I, I don't believe shame on me, but I, I, I was fulfilling my duty as clerk. So I'm just gonna put that out there. Thank you, thank you, you're right. Actually, there's one more, Sam. Boyden, but I don't, if it's the same person as Ace Boyden, we've already heard from you. So I'm going to ask you, are you have you already spoken? Sam? Hello, Sam. Okay. Hello, am I there? Yes, have you already spoken? Because I have two Boydens on here. No, I have not spoken. Okay. I, 
listen, I got really no interest in this and I've been listening to this whole thing for a while, but I just want to put a story out there. I, I go to two main car washes in the area and both on Canton Center. One is the one over uh, that new coin car wash, not the coin one, the, uh, the, quick, the quick car wash. Sometimes that's always busy. The other one is the coin car wash where there's, there's a car wash to quick lube in the coin. That is so difficult to get in and out of there. I don't see a problem with actually having another one somewhere area in another area where I can actually drive down to if I got to drive three to four miles or it is to get my car washed. So if there's another business and the guy wants to bring tax dollars into our city, so what? There's, to me, so what? There's competition. To me, more competition, no better, a little better for us. But I want a convenience for myself. I want to be able to get in and out and get get done when I need to get done because I have a very busy day. Honestly, I don't think there's a problem at all. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. So I don't see any new hands up. I'm going to um, so I close in terms of the public comment of this. Um, Summer, would you like to add anything as you're on the planning commission and you were part of the discussions? Yeah, so the, the, the discussion on the planning commission, um, it, it wasn't this interesting. Um, so uh, the comments to the, from the planning commission mostly centered about the layout um, of the car wash um, and you know the, the entrance and the exit from the car wash, um, but it did pass through the planning commission um, unanimously. So those concerns ended up being alleviated. I know that there was a little bit of concern about um, potentially putting another um, business in the location, a, a fast food restaurant or something, um, but we were only asked to approve the site plan for the car wash. And so that's what we took a look at at, our, at the planning commission meeting. All right, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Jade, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to, to um, back up what uh, Trustee Foster just said in regards to the other businesses. The only site plan or special land use we're looking at tonight in, in approving is the car wash. The other three buildings that are shown in your packet, those are a potential, but they're not before you tonight to take any action and they will come back for formal action with the Planning Commission and with the Board of Trustees. Thank you. Patrick, is there anything you want to add? Based on your plan here, it's very detailed for the special um, land use. Yeah, nothing beyond the written report, but um, I can answer any questions that come up from the board. Okay. Does anyone on the board have any questions? Tanya? Um, I, this is a question for Patrick. Um, so when do you, when do you ask for a traffic study? Is it later? Is it during the site plan or like in the future? When do you ask for a traffic study? Because um, it's kind of a um, drive through business. So that's the reason I'm asking that question. Sure. The um, requirement for a traffic study is often dependent on uh, the use, the location, uh, the intensity, the, the existing roadway network infrastructure, and a lot of factors. And um, in this case, um, the, uh, when the township engineer was looking at the special land use review, um, there was not a request at this time for a traffic study. Um, that doesn't mean that there uh, couldn't be a traffic study by Wayne County when they review the curb cuts onto Canton Center Road and Old Canton Center Road because those two roads are under the jurisdiction of Wayne County. So Wayne County will, may have its own requirements for a traffic study, but most certainly uh, the location of the curb cuts and whether there's going to be a requirement for a taper or an XL lane or a decel lane. Um, the, the township, um, the township engineering division, they, they could require a um, a traffic study if they wanted to with either a special land use or a site plan um, or for example for the proposed fast food restaurants on the uh, on the site oftentimes fast food restaurants will require traffic impact study just because of their peak traffic times are, are those p.m uh, peak hours sometimes the a.m peak hour as well so it is something that um, that can be required by the township um, when it when it looks like there's going to be um, a capacity issue with a with a particular use. Um, in this case, um, there are uh, four points of access. Two of the points are from an existing drive um, on the site. So there's an existing drive on Old Canton Center Road and, and Canton Center Road to the west that exists for uh, the bank and for 7-Eleven. So those will be um, 
those will be two of the four points of access that already exist today. And then there's two new ones on Old Canton Center and New Canton Center, one each. And just to add to that too, this will go to Wayne County for their review. So although there wasn't a true traffic study that was done for this, it will go to Wayne County for their comments and review and approval. So you don't need it, but you might do, would you request it in the future when like things change? Uh, engineering will take a look at that. And as Patrick said, depending on what is proposed to go on the rest of the site, then that would make, we'd make the determination at that time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kate. Um, yes, a couple of questions. Thank you. Do you know um, when Wayne County might be taking a look at um, those entrance points? I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I will have to ask engineer. I don't know, Patrick, if you know if anything's been sent to them as of yet. It would depend on when we sent it to them and that I don't know if it's gone already. Yeah, and sometimes it depends it's, it's, on the... Oh, sorry. And again, this is for the, the use of the property. So when the site plan is actually finalized, um, that's actually when um, some of that information will, will be required to have back from the county as well before that decision can be made. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and another question is, um, you know, I've heard a lot of talk about the water um, that will be used at the car wash. And so I'm wondering about um, how are we taking care of, or how is that water going to be disposed of? Um, I can speak a little bit to the zoning requirement. Um, one of the, the, the zoning requirements for car washes, uh, there are several different requirements that are unique to that particular use. And one of the requirements is that uh, there must be a minimum distance of 125 feet between the exit door of the wash structure to the nearest exit driveway to permit adequate time for excess water to drip off of the vehicle. So there's an existing requirement for 125 feet in the zoning ordinance. The way that the proposed car wash lays out on the site, the car will exit on the south side of the building and then um, wrap around and go northward. Um, I think it's at least a couple hundred feet until it gets to the nearest drive at uh, Old Canton Center Road that's proposed. So the way that the, the building and the drive is laid out, it exceeds that particular standard. Okay. Um, so you don't anticipate an issue with the road icing up? I would uh, probably defer to the applicant on that in terms of the technology of the car wash to see if they have any data on anything beyond 125 feet where they've had issues with water or icing up. So okay. who, who would I promote for that? Dan LeClaire, Patrick? Um, yeah, you can try Mr. LeClaire, and then if he wants to uh, request one of his colleagues, um, he, can, he can ask. Okay, Mr. LeClaire, can you answer that? Sorry about that, just cut out. This is Dan LeClaire from Green Tech Engineering. Um, yeah, the actually the length of the lane outbound from the car wash um, exceeds um, two of the other car washes that he's currently got, uh, that he currently uses. Um, one of the things that also improves the, or reduces the amount of water that comes off of a vehicle is the equipment inside the car wash. Um, the proposed equipment is new technology. It's uh, the latest and greatest, which does take uh, the majority of the water off of the vehicles as they leave. Um, but there is over 400 feet of drive aisle uh, from the time that the vehicle leaves the car wash building, uh, goes past the uh, vacuum stations, the drying stations. So if somebody were to bypass all of that, uh, it's over 400 feet to the closest exit 
which is Old Canton Center Road, which is very, uh, very lightly traveled. Um, so, so you can easily double that if a vehicle were to leave and go out to Canton Center or even through to Michigan Avenue. Um, the other thing uh, with respect to Wayne County, we have already submitted the plans to Wayne County. Um, so we're anticipating getting comments uh, back to you folks or back to planning department and engineering department uh, prior to uh, going to planning commission for the site plan approval. So um, the water disposal that is uh, uh, this, with the respect to the sewer, um, this water is recycled. Um, there is a discharge obviously to the sewer. It's not all completely recycled and cleaned, but uh, it's handled just as if uh, the same methodology that his other uh, car wash is taken care of in Canton Township. And I did just uh, share my screen. Hopefully you can see um, the proposed. So this, I, I believe what he was talking about, this would be the exit of the car wash here coming down and then having a traverse up this way in order to exit out onto Canton Center, Old Canton Center this way, or back in through and out this way. Okay, thank you. Um, and one um, final question. Since we're only looking at the car wash tonight, um, if there were going to be a fast food restaurant um, built on this property that would have a drive-through, that would come up for approval at a later time. And if there were, say for example, um, definitely going to be a, a drive-through, then, then there would probably be a, a traffic study done. Is that right? Um, the, the applicants have recently submitted a special land use application for a drive through restaurant, and that's currently being evaluated by staff. Um, a couple of unique aspects that may require a traffic study is that the proposed fast food restaurants are closer to Canton Center Road and uh, closer to that proposed curb cut of Canton Center Road. Um, also, fast food restaurants, the uniqueness of the use is, is the heavy traffic. Uh, that they often generate. So although we're still evaluating that, those, those may be indicators of additional traffic data. And, um, and also, if we had a traffic study only for the use proposed at, at the time, which was a car wash use, that may not pick up other proposed uses on the site because I don't know if those uses had been identified several months ago uh, when the original application was made. If they were, they were probably more conceptual, but if they have a tenant in mind now, uh, we may have a more realistic vision of what the actual traffic would be, be that the traffic would be based on uh, the prospective tenants. So um, now might be a more, uh, more appropriate time to require that, but we'll check with the engineering division on that and let them know those concerns. Okay. All right, that, um, that was good information, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Steven? Sorry. Thank you. Um, so a few questions. Um, some of them were already answered for me. Um, one is, um, Madam Supervisor, I'd be interested um, from legal counsel, Kristen Kolb, for an opinion on whether the um, township board can um, legally restrict market saturation. Um, I, and, oh, Jade, looks like you have some information on that. Yes, um, I have discussed this with legal counsel and we did discuss it today. Um, and there would have to be something within the zoning ordinance in order to, um, to turn it down. And there is nothing that we have that actually monitors or um, uh, that addresses saturation. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd be interested in um, just a letter opinion ver um, stating from legal counsel what she told Director Smith for us sure. as a board. Um, just so we understand what powers we do and don't have. Um, <clears throat> and um, the other question for Patrick is, I know in the past when we've discussed drive-throughs and I know we're not talking about the drive-throughs now, um, but we've talked about different types of drive-throughs 
and um, the difference between, say, a McDonald's drive through with the remote ordering facility and pull up with multiple lanes and things like that versus um, like a Big B's coffee or something like that, um, or, <clears throat> or maybe Panera. Um, do we have indication that any of those would be excluded right now? Um, that it could be anything? Um, right now, as a, as a fast food restaurant, the, the zoning district is the, uh, the C3 district, which is the regional commercial. And many of the areas along Michigan Avenue in the same area um, are also zone C3. And there's a number of different uh, fast food franchises that are, that are located there. Um, the typical fast food restaurant um, in the zoning ordinance, there are 10 stacking spaces required. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the minimum number of stacking spaces. Um, in the case of McDonald's, over the last few years, they've added a, a double lane because in a lot of cases, 10 is, is not enough. And for, for circulation, they've added um, a, a portion of a second lane in, in some areas. Uh, so 10 would be the minimum. If the applicant wanted to go below 10, they would have to seek a variance and show a practical difficulty. And um, that would be mostly use specific in terms of if they're going to have a product that they anticipate less than 10 stacking spaces at one time. Otherwise, if it's just a generic fast food restaurant or one of the more mainstream ones with the, the normal peak PM hour traffic, then they would have to have the 10 stacking spaces before the pickup window. Okay. Um, yeah, so it sounds like it could be any of those things at this point in time, depending on um, what they come forward with, but the zoning would allow any of those things. Um, and uh, Patrick, um, when you, if it doesn't, don't need an answer now, you weren't here, um, many here were not here at the time when the um, other um, car wash on North Canton Road was put in a few years ago. Um, the comment about it being membership only, I remember discussion about memberships. I don't remember if there was anything about it being membership only. And I don't know if there was anything in <clears throat> that would restrict them to membership only other than you know their word or something at the time. So it'd be interesting to see if you could go back and let us know um, if there was anything that uh, absolutely restricted them to membership. Um, and then lastly, um, just confirm that this is just the first step in this process that there are many other approvals to come forward. And um, if at any time something comes up that we don't think it's viable that we have the chance to um, decide not to go forward with this. This is just, um, the request for a variant, not a variance, but a um, special land use, right? Thank you, um, Stephen. Just to um, add on to what Jade said, Krista Cole did confirm the same with me in terms of we do not have zoning that states there's in terms of saturation. I can forward you the email. Oh, yeah, great. She, she said it to me also, Stephen. I asked earlier. Okay, well, I guess now I believe three of you. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, Jade. Jade. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't I don't believe me, that's okay. <laughs> I did believe Jade too. I just wanted to have something. So if, yeah, if you could just forward that to me, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank Michael? You. Um, my question, Patrick. So I understand we don't have a saturation ordinance or a saturation requirement in the zoning ordinance. Um, I was just curious, another way of thinking about this is a distance, a distance uh, requirement. Do we have any distance requirements in, in the zoning ordinance for certain types of uses? I know in our regulated business ordinances for sexually oriented businesses, for massage establishments, we're talking about using, doing that for food trucks from existing businesses. We have some distance requirements. Um, do we have any distance requirements for specific uses inside of the zoning ordinance do do any municipalities in Michigan have that um, I've seen in other communities where they do it usually for things that are like um, you want to keep away from schools and residential areas right like the things I kind of went through massage parlors uh, adult novelty stores um, you know video theaters and things like that but do we do we have them from like similar uses for 
I don't know, fast food restaurants, car washes, obviously was a, was a hot one tonight. Um, is, is that is that allowed under the uh, Zoning Enabling Act or Planning Enabling Act? Or? Um, there, there can be setback distances. Um, there are setback distances in the ordinance from lot lines or in some cases, um, residential districts from either a non-residential district or a particular non-residential use. And some of those uses that you did mention in terms of a separation from each other, um, sometimes uh, that's to prevent a concentration of, of certain types of land uses that, um, that can be known to decline an area in terms of uh, property values and, and a whole host of other secondary effects of having those many uh, types of uses. So um, some zoning ordinances will want to spread those types of uses out. In terms of, um, in terms of uh, businesses, the Zoning Act uh, doesn't have a lot of separation requirements particular to businesses, but one item it does have is uh, group daycare homes, for example. Uh, for a group daycare home that has between seven and 12 kids, it can't be within 1,500 feet of another group daycare, although it does allow a local community to modify that requirement and to, and to grant relief from it. Um, but beyond that, uh, it would be individual to the community in terms of what kind of setbacks that they want to have between two types of businesses. And um, for, for businesses where there's not a secondary effect of, you know, whether it's crime or property value or some of these other issues that we see um, with a whole host of land uses, without that, sometimes there's no reason to have a separation between two of the same uses. Uh, in some cases in the township, we have fast food restaurants right next to each other um, with car washes on um, a mile stretch of Canton Center Road between Ford and Warren. Um, we've got two car washes within that mile stretch. Um, so it's really a market driven um, venture in terms of if they want to move closer to a similar use, sometimes they think it's to their benefit. Sometimes the market's big enough to have another, but um, it's usually up to the applicant to make that determination and um, the township can can ask for some data in terms of uh, justification for it, but sometimes some of that market data is proprietary and, and they won't want to share it. It's just a matter of do they meet zoning, do they meet the special land use standards, and if there's not any kind of demonstrated excessive type of saturation that would lead it to a detrimental effect on the surrounding area, then um, we wouldn't really have much in the way of um, denying a use. Yeah, I know a great, I know when, when establishing the regulations for tobacco uh, smoking establishments, I know that you great, great thought had to go into creating the, um, the cap uh, on how many uses were going to be allowed um, because you couldn't just be arbitrary and capricious and say, okay, we're going to cap it at two or five or six. You had to kind of explain why um, from a public health standpoint. Um, now, an adult, or I'm sorry, not an adult, but a, a daycare, that would be a, a, something that would be occurring in a residentially zoned area, right? That you were talking about. So you regulate uses from each other inside of, because essentially you're operating a commercial enterprise inside of a residential area. So that might be probably why you want to have that distance, right? Um, so you don't have commercial stacking of cars on the same residential street because there's two daycares operating in the same subdivision, probably. Right, and the, the Zoning Act allows for uh, local communities to, um, to modify or waive that requirement. So it still allows for a local evaluation of that 1500 feet and to look at the community or look at the neighborhood and, and see is 1500 something that we want to uphold or in certain cases, do they want to grant relief? And that's a type of thing on a case by case basis. And it's, because it's in a residential neighborhood, it's something that would be more sensitive. Okay, but currently as Corporation Council has said, and just to reiterate, market saturation or use distance is not, um, would not be um, kind of germane to applying our, our zoning ordinance right now under special land use. Is, is that a, a fair assumption? Correct. Right. be outside of the scope of the zoning ordinance. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you, are there any other questions? So, Clerk Secrets, can we please take roll call on the motion? Borninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Graham uh, Gangvilli. Aye. Graham Hudak. Aye. Secrets, aye. Slavens. Aye. 
Night amendment. All right. Thank you. Motion passes. Um, the next item is consider approval of the Grand View South final site plan. Madam Supervisor, I move that the board approve the following resolution, the approval of the final site plan for Grandview South. Whereas the project sponsor has requested approval of the final site plan for Grandview South located on the north side of Mock Road between Denton Road, Bar Road, and directly south of Grandview Estates. And whereas the Planning Commission reviewed the final site plan for Grandview South and voted eight to zero to recommend approval of the request as it meets the design requirements of the zoning ordinance and condominium ordinance and is consistent with the plan development agreement for Grandview South. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Charter Township of Canton, Michigan, does hereby approve the final site plan for Grandview South on the tax parcel numbers listed as proposed in the plan documents, including uh, retaining the east dead end of Bluebell Street and accompanying sidewalks to the eastern lot line and subject to all applicable state and local development regulations. Report. Thank you. Grandview South is a proposed plan development district of 221 detached condominiums on 76.59 net acres, which is 2.89 units per net acre, located on the north side of Mott Road between Denton and Bar Road. Grandview South is part of the Grandview Estates PDD located directly north and Grandview South is proposed to connect directly to Grandview Estates via Cranston Road and Bingham Road. The only other ent entrances proposed to Grandview South are on Mott Road on the south part of the site, located about 1,000 feet west of Denton Road, and on Bar Road on the west part of the site. The project sponsor proposes to pave Mott Road from Denton Road to the southern entrance to the development. The plan development district amendment and preliminary site plan for Grandview South were approved by the Township Board of Trustees on September 24, 2019. Since approval of the preliminary site plan, the final site plan has been changed to add an entrance to Bar Road reduce the overall density by one unit as a result and realign three internal intersections of the Grandview South to address traffic speed concerns. When the plan development district was approved, the definite benefits to the community included the following. Paving approximately 1,100 feet of Mott Road from the development entrance to Denton Road, maintaining 31.6% of the site, which is 24.2 acres as open space, which exceeds the 25% open space minimum, preserving approximately 400 trees that are either protected or landmark trees and providing two one-year memberships to the summit for each of the proposed units. Jade, do you have anything to add to that? Um, just to confirm and remind everybody that back when this was brought before the board last September, there were some major concerns with the property owners to the north and all of those concerns have been um, by Pulte and they've met with the homeowners and as they said they have realigned some of their streets and taken out one unit to put another exit or entrance out onto Bar Road which was probably the biggest concern um, that the residents had so um, I'm real happy that they actually listened to the feedback that evening and then went and met with the residents to the north. All right thank you do we have any public comment or questions I'm looking at the attendees you can raise your hand if you're on a phone you could hit star six I see one with Sandra. And so please identify yourself and um, where you live, where you're from. Sandra. Hello again. Hello. I'm, Hello, Sandra. I'm Sandra Miller. And I do live in Grandview Estates and uh, have been a resident there since April of 2018. And our residents have made efforts to stay abreast of Pulte's Grandview South development since we first became aware of it in uh, November of 2019, I believe. One of our efforts was to appear before the Board of Trustees to express our concerns and offer input over several issues that would impact our already established community. Uh, Mr. Segrist may recall that in particular when a number of our residents appeared. One of those concerns was the impact of increased traffic flow through our subdivision due to the lack of a direct entry and egress from Grandview uh, South to and from Bar Road. This was especially critical because even though the Grandview South development plans reflected an entry egress to and from Mott Road, which is to be, uh, Mott Road is to be partially paved. However, Pulte expressed at that time that it would not happen for some time in the future. Uh, the other concern was the resulting increased traffic flow 
along Bingham and Cranston roads with no impediments to speed uh, by northbound and southbound vehicles. So I do want to commend Pulte in this regard because they worked with our group. Uh, we did come up with what we believe was a solution that negotiated at least uh, something that was partially satisfactory to both parties, both to affect a change to Bar Road, which is not going to be uh, paved, and um, to uh, add those kind of like roundabouts on Bingham and uh, Cranston to slow traffic. So those changes did increase Pulte's costs somewhat by the fact that they did have to add back into their plans, the Bar Road uh, entrance and egress. And they also did have to lose one of the units that they had planned for the development. So believe me when I say that we are very appreciative of Pulte's actions, especially uh, Mr. Scorey in this regard. But I'm hopeful now that with your urging to accompany your approval of this final plan, because uh, we are, we're excited that Canton is growing and we by no means would be uh, you know, challenging the fact that 221 units are being built into Canton, that's great. But we would hope that you would urge Pulte. We've had problems all along with construction traffic. The fact that uh, there's nothing that they can come into off of Mott Road means that it does leave Bar Road and our entrance and exits out of our. And I, I think that that will become more critical as development is along Michigan Avenue, especially if it's true that Amazon is coming just uh, east of us. So I would just ask that the board would at least make a note to urge Pulte to continue to uh, monitor construction traffic so that they use what uh, the Planning Commission and Pulte and our group has asked that construction traffic would come in and out off of Bar Road rather than through our subdivision. We were just told today that Grandview Estates and Grandview South would in fact be separate entities. So additional uh, damage to our roads will be at our costs, you know, if it's done by heavy construction traffic, which we expect to happen over the next three or four years if our subdivision is any indication. So it's mainly a plea to you folks just to say, Pulte, we love the work that you've done, but please continue to uh, be mindful of the residents of Grandview Estates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sandra. Um, Joe, would you like to add anything to that? I just promoted um, Joe Scorey from Pulte. Sure, uh, Joe Scorey with Pulte Homes. Um, I, I appreciate Sandy's comments. She and I have had many conversations over the last couple of years, and, and I'm glad that that she's uh, that she's satisfied, and 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 I and I appreciate her comments. Um, the only thing I would say is. Yes, uh, construction traffic is always a concern and we are directing all our construction traffic to use the bar road entrance. Um, and so we, we plan to keep uh, construction vehicles off, off the roads uh, to the best we can. Uh, now, I, I've said this before and I mentioned this to the planning commission, sometimes you know, trades have a mind of their own, but we're gonna do everything, everything we can to enforce uh, that policy and, and that rule, and uh, and that's what we plan to do. And so we we we, but we're confident that that construction traffic will will use the bar road entrance only. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands or on the attendees on this type topic. Okay, thank you, Michael. Go ahead. I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Score for um, working with the township on this project. I know you did not have to. And uh, so I appreciate that you did. Um, you know, I had a hard time voting against the initial, the preliminary site plan, but this final, sorry. Um, we have these environmentally friendly lights that turn off when there's not enough motion. So it just shut off on me there. <laughs> Gotta wave my hand like a maniac sometimes. Anyway, um, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, putting in the roundabouts and adding that that outtick to, to Bar Road, I, you know, I really do appreciate that. 
you guys uh, go above and beyond. And, and it's a pleasure working with you. And so thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Summer, did you want to add anything? No, um, I would just add again what um, Director Smith said um, about Pulte working with um, the folks in the subdivision to alleviate their concerns and happy to see um, the roundabouts. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? Tanya? Yeah, um, I had a question and, um, you know, Patrick had some concerns on the decks in the back and uh, saying that uh, he has provided you enough information on their plan because he said they didn't, they didn't have enough setback if you had some of the units had decks. So I was just wondering if they have provided you with enough information to go ahead and um, approve this. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, they they have. Um, originally, they they wanted to delineate an area on the plans to allow for a ten foot uh, deck off the back. Um, I think it was ten feet. And the ordinance, the zoning ordinance, does allow a deck to encroach in a rear yard setback as long as a uh, distance of uh, 25 feet is maintained. And so um, most of the units show a dashed outline for a deck on the rear side, although some units specifically exclude that on the plans because the deck would encroach into the required setback. So um, most of those um, can have the 10 foot deck as it's illustrated, but those that can't do not illustrate the deck. And it's called out on the plan that those units uh, can't have a certain model where um, the, the wall would encroach so far that a deck could not be built. So there, there will be some uh, use restrictions or not use, but uh, building model restrictions on a handful of those units. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and I also wanted to commend the story of Pulte Homes for listening to, um, you know, the neighbors and uh, uh, putting into, I'm like, you know, taking into consideration the traffic impact there. And I really like this plan because it has a lot more green spaces than required. So I'm looking forward to what's going to happen in regards to green spaces in that uh, neighborhood. Thank you. Anyone Thank you. else? Steven? Um, yeah, echo what everybody else said. Um, I remember us all going through this with you and I, um, it, thank you for proving us right that we can approve something and move forward, but still um, work with you to make changes that the community wants. So I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, and um, great idea with the roundabouts. You know, I, I know that that was going to be a, uh, an issue and, and I was wondering how you were gonna solve it. So bravo. Um, the thing that I was, I uh, didn't un understand completely is is the road down on Mott Road not going to be constructed right away and that's why you can't use that for construction tra uh, traffic yeah yeah um, it's it's in our it's in our third phase or the last phase oh, so okay. it's it's going to be installed it's just not during uh, phase 1 of this development i see okay got you and i noticed the um, the um, the road access going off to the east, um, potentially for something future. Okay. That's correct. All right. Um, so yeah, if I can just agree, get you to agree right now to pave Bar Road too um, with it, just <laughs> say yes or no really quickly. Don't even think about it. <laughs> so, somehow I knew that was coming. I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for working with us. I you're, 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 and I'm, Glad Mott will be paved that for the portion that you are paving it. So. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Clerk Segrist, please call roll on the motion. Roll call. Korninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Muley. Aye. Jim Hudek. Aye. Segristi Slavens. Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Next item G4, 
Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Consider award of contract to Fishback for the 2021 Water Main Capital Improvement Project. Madam Supervisor, I move to award a contract as presented in the amount totaling $46,530 for the 2021 Water Main Capital Improvement Projects and further authorize the Township Supervisor or Clerk to sign the contracts on behalf of the Charter Township of Canton. Support. Thank you. The 2018 Water Master Plan identified a number of projects necessary to meet the existing and future water demands of our customers. In addition to the master plan, staff is constantly evaluating locations that are experiencing multiple main breaks in a relatively small area. Staff is recommending a word of contract under the currently existing professional services agreement for professional engineering design to fish back for an amount not to exceed $46,530. This amount includes a 10% contingency. Fishback served in the same position for the 2019 and 2020 Water Main CIP. Uh, Jay, did you want to add, add anything? Um, just real quick, just because we have some new trustees. Uh, Fishback is one of our engineering firms that has a service agreement with the township um, that is good for five years. So that's why we are utilizing them um, and do not need to go back up to bid to use them. And then also this is just for the design of the water main. We will be back before you for the approval of the uh, once it's bid out for the construction. Um, this is, it's important for us to stay on track with these kinds of improvements so that we make sure that our utilities and our underwater, or underwater, our underground utilities are, um, we, we, we don't want them to get aged and if we just see too many breaks within a certain amount of, of uh, lineage of the utility, then it's, we make sure that it's a priority that we get that uh, swept out and fix that so we don't get far behind. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, great. Clerk Seekers, can you please call roll on the motion? Roll call. Tracy. Aye. Foster. Aye. Kanguli. Aye. Graham Hudak. Aye. Seekers, aye. Slavens. Aye. Snydevitt. Thank you. Motion passes. Item G5. Consider approving budget amendment and awarding purchase order to lead point for project management and staffing services for the 2021 recycling improvement program. Madam Supervisor, I move um, to approve a purchase order in the amount of $68,000 to lead point to provide staffing and training for the 2021 recycling improvement program and the, to approve the attached budget amendment. Support. Thank you. April 19, 2021, Canton is to begin a comprehensive education and operations behavior strategy to decrease contamination from curbside recycling. The goal is to change recycling behavior in Canton and decrease recycling contamination. Through Michigan Department of Envi Environmental Great Lakes and Energy, EGLA, Municipal Services was able to secure grant dollars to help with the funding. Due to Canton's 28,500 recycling customers, one project manager and six teams of two or 12 people will be needed to walk in front of recycling trucks to inspect and report the contents of resident recycling carts. Canton posted and received six applicants willing to complete this task. All six applicants were hired directly by Canton. Municipal services are recommending the remaining inspectors and project manager to be hired by Lead Point, a staffing company very familiar with the Eagle Grant. Lead Point has not only provided such staff for Michigan communities, but others around the country for recycling improvement programs. Inspectors will record inspection information on a mobile app. Lead Point has also agreed to provide inspection teams with the needed phones and provide training to the project manager and inspection team. An amount not to exceed $68,000 is being sought for approval, all of which is reimbursable to Canton. The Lead Point agreement has been reviewed by the township attorney. Jay, did you wanna add anything? Yeah, just a quick comment in regards to the hiring process. And we were hoping to hire all of the part-time inspectors in-house, but due to the, um, the trouble we've been having hiring part-time employees across the entire organization, uh, this company who has worked with this grant before, they're kind of experts and they have a built-in pool of candidates. So it makes sense just to go with them. Uh, the important thing is, is that their fee is actually going to be covered by the grant dollars. That's why we're bringing the budget amendment before you today. So as we expend these dollars, uh, we will be reimbursed through this grant. Any questions? Okay. Thanks. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, do we know if lead point would be paying 
um, anyone they hired for these positions the same amount as the um, the ones the people that the um, township hired directly. I am not 100% on that. I know we're paying them uh, a little over $30 an hour, but that takes in consideration their administrative and operation fees and their, their taxes and covers everything. Brad Lear is on the call um, and I don't know, I know he had a conversation with Lead Point. I know they're paying competitive, but I do not know if they're paying the $20 an hour that uh, Can Township was offering. Okay, um, I guess I'm, I'm concerned that there might be um, some concern between um, the employees. Um, we have had extensive conversation with Lead Point in regards to this. They've done this in other communities where they have done a hybrid of both their employees and the community hiring. So they didn't mention that there were any sort of, there were any concerns, um, but we can definitely, you know, make sure that we manage that appropriate. And especially having six teams of two, um, those, those teams will have the Canton's team and then the lead point. They're all gonna work under lead point as far as their guidance goes, but we can talk with them in regards to keeping the teams somewhat separate, but I don't foresee um, any issues. And I know we have the conversations I've been involved in, we haven't had any of those concerns brought up. Okay. Yeah, I do see your point though. Okay. The other um, question I have is about the length of the contract. It says it's for one year with two one year options um, thereafter. And so um, we're, I, are we planning to continue the recycling pilot um, next yeah. year or? <laughs> no, we're not. I, I think that we could have contracted with them last year, which actually would have actually helped us because if this was supposed to be a 2020 grant, I think that was just some boilerplate language um, that was in their contract. We will not be renewing for an additional one year. At the end of these nine weeks, we will actually not be utilizing their services any longer. Um, and, and as I said, the township attorney looked at this too. So um, I can go back and, and we can strike that out of this contract, um, but we will not be, we won't be acting on those renewals. Okay. But unless the board wants to do another education program next year, which I'll be back before you for that. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, any other questions? I, I also had like, I. Kate asked my question about the one year thing. So can we make sure that that happens because we are voting on something and hope that it's amended in the contract? Yeah, and I, it, absolutely. And I can't utilize them anyway until I would come back before you with an, a budget amendment to expend more dollars. The 68,000 is just gonna take care of this nine weeks. So um, there would be further action to take even to renew the contract, but I will get that addressed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, Clerk Segris, can you please take roll call on the motion? What is he? Aye. Foster. Aye. Mooley. Aye. From Hudak. Aye. Segris, aye. Slavens. Aye. Slavens. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Item G6, consider approval to purchase digital plan review tables capability to review large scale digital plans in all MSD divisions. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve purchase contract with iProject Solutions LLC and Van Buren Electric for the purchase of multi digital plan tables and associated electrical work needed in an amount not to exceed $57,000. Support. Thank you. In order to view and work with our existing and future large scale digital plans, we would like to approve, we would like approval to purchase five desktop digital plan review tables and one mobile digital plan review station. Staff is recommending approval of a contract with iProject Solutions LLC and Van Buren Electric in the total amount not to exceed $57,000. There is no other equipment on the market that meets the, oops, mm -hmm. it stops there. Sorry, the standards. Uh, Jay, did you have anything to add to that? <laughs> My apologies, yes, I obviously got distracted. Um, yes, there is no other equipment on the market that is like the iPlan table that we're looking at. 
Um, all of the division um, heads uh, from building, planning, engineering, and public works have all looked at the product. Um, it can be utilized across the, the entire organization. And what we're, we're really help is that if you can only imagine the, the large plans that come in and flipping through all of the, pap the, the pages, this is gonna allow them to actually mark up electronically and send back just one specific sheet or multiple sheets back to the petitioner. Um, and then I did include some of the advantages and some photos of what the plan tables are going to look like in your packet. If you didn't see those, I can share my screen and show you those as well. This is in the current year budget um, uh, to, for, for these purchases and, and it's divided up amongst the, all the divisions within MSD. And I apologize about that typo. Well, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Michael? Um, I didn't see that this was bid out. I was just curious if you could kind of walk me through that. Um, looks like we got a quote Van Buren Electric and from the other program. I don't know. Did we get three quotes? Um, we did not because there's no other there's no other equipment on the market like this. Um, this is a this is a one unit um, apparatus, if you will. Um, it's much sturdier. They've uh, so they kind of have a corner on the market in regards to this technology. In regards to Van Buren Buren Electric. That was a quote that was given to us by facilities in order to run the appropriate um, cabling to hook up the uh, the devices. Okay, so for we, we did work with IT and did talk with them in regards to if there was any sort of bid um, bid pricing out there that was uh, part of a national bid or anything like that. And there was not there was nothing out there. Okay, so is is Van Buren Electric like the company we go to for? Electric. No, we will be going right to iPlan tables themselves. Um, Van Buren Electric is, they have supplied, we're, we're going at, I, well, it's called iProject Solutions, um, which is where we're getting the actual devices. And then Van Buren Electric, they're, the quote that's in there, they have broken it down by the different um, areas where these are going to be set up. And they have a pricing as to what their work is going to be within each area. So for instance, you know, where they need to add wall receptacles, install data jacks and, and uh, additional cable. So that, that is the extent of the work with Van Buren Electric Company, which that total cost is $3,670 $3, of the 57,000. Right. So my question is why, why Van Buren Electric? Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to answer that. I'm gonna to have to use Craig um, as facilities. That's who they have used throughout the township, I believe. Um, to run this type of, uh, of work. And actually, I take that back. I don't know if it's Greg or if it's IT, and I don't mean to put either of those two directors on the spot. I just don't have that answer. Wendy, do you know, did we? I know, I know that's a facilities as far as the electrical goes, so I have to punt that to Greg. Can you restate your question? Like, uh, uh, so my question is, so procurement policy, um, we're required to get three bids uh, for services or products. Here we have a $3,600 service from Van Buren Electric on item G6. And so my, my question is, is um, there a reason why we don't have multiple quotes or we didn't get the work I Electric? I don't know the history on, on how we came to that. So I would have to look into that. Um, it's quite possible that we did get three quotes and they were, but it's just not indicated in the RBA. Um, I will tell you because my question was somewhat rhetorical. Okay. The answer to this question, which is that we have an existing relationship with Van Buren Electric. And while we didn't necessarily formalize it and bid it and select them as an approved vendor. They are our go-to electrical vendor. They've done all the electrical work in the clerk's office as well, which was also not quoted by other outside agencies. And so I just wanted to talk about sometimes we have special relationships with companies and we don't necessarily go through the formal procurement policy on them. So interesting enough. I, I also think that um items under $5,000 don't need to get three quotes either. 
So it's once it's over a certain oh, number, really? we need to get more quotes. But we do have a relationship with Van Buren Electric as well. And they do a lot of work for the township. Wait, we don't need to get uh, three quotes on items under $5,000 under the procurement policy? Um, and that would have saved me. I stand corrected. We do need to get three informal quotes, three in right. written, but we do need to get three informal quotes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So I, I can yep. verify and follow up with the board on whether or not uh, that was done for for this item. Um, I just wasn't prepared to answer that question tonight. Are there any other questions? I feel like NBC's the more you know should just flash across the screen now. So do we want to table this or move forward? Oh, Kate, go ahead. So if at some point the board does vote to um, purchase these, I am hoping that we could um, have a little demonstration when it's safe. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. I think you would be very impressed. So is there a thought on tabling or go ahead and vote on the motion? Do I hear, hear anyone? Asking for a table. Okay. Clerk Stegris, can you please take a roll call on the motion? Orninsky. Aye. Foster. Aye. Ganguly. Aye. Graham Hudak. Aye. Stegris, aye. Slavens. Aye. Snyderman. Aye. aye. <clears throat> motion passes. Item G7. For this one, I am going to promote Laura Ha, panelist. Consider award of contract purchase order and budget amendment for completion of 2021 five year park and recreation master plan. I have an appointment tomorrow morning with Rosanna and IT to look at my oh yes um, because it's crashed. I have a routine issue that when I use our board packet, um, which is fairly substantial in size, it tends to crash on me. At which point I sit there in silence, and then somebody offers to read the motion, and then I say, "No, that's okay. Don't worry about that." Um, so hopefully this issue will be solved in the future. And I'm currently stalling. So nobody offers to do that. And I am now ready to read the motion. Oh, so, great. Madam mm -hmm. Supervisor, I move to consider award of contract and purchase order in the amount of $46,500 to McKenna at the uh, address of 235 East Main Street, Suite 105, Northville, Michigan, 48167 for the completion of the 20. 21 five-year park and recreation master plan and to approve the attached um, 2021 general fund budget amendment. Mark. Thank you. The current Canton Leisure Services five-year park and recreation master plan will expire on February 1st, 2022. The master plan is an inventory of current assets, a listing of all public and private providers and a comprehensive capital action plan. Michigan Department of Natural Resources requires an up-to-date master plan to be eligible for any grants available through the MDNR. The master plan is also a requirement for agency accreditation through the Commission for Accreditation of Park and Recreation Agencies. This year's plan will also include additional components to help with the community pathway and park planning. A request for a proposal was recently advertised for consulting services to develop a five-year park and recreation master plan. Eight qualified companies submitted proposals. A team of six representatives from Leisure Services and Finance reviewed the proposals and based on the review, McKenna was selected to perform the work. The top four consultants participated in interviews and the staff representatives identified McKenna as a recommended consultant for the master plan project in the amount of $40,000. Recent board and a community interest to have a current vision for Patriot Park has led to Canton asking McKenna for a proposal to update the Patriot Park plan. The addition of the Patriot Park plan update will necessitate a budget amendment in the amount of $6,500. Based on the proposals and interviews, we are recommending awarding the contract to McKenna 
in the total amount of $46,500. Greg, did you want to add anything, you or Jeanette? Um, I would just say that, uh, interestingly enough, we were going through this process at uh, the same time that Director Smith was going through a process for planning services for um, his department and uh, kind of independent of each other. We both selected McKenna for our contractor. We we're very impressed with them. We've not used them for our master planning services um, previously, so we're excited to work with them, and I think this will kind of continue our planning process. As you recall, uh, we talked about the, our planning process as we do the community survey one year, um, utilize that input the following year as we um, discuss you know, the master plan and then that master plan kind of rolls into our strategic plan, which we have uh, planned for next year. So with that, I don't know if Laura, if you have any information or board, if you have any questions. Laura, do you want to add anything? Just um, good evening, trustees. Laura Hall with McKenna. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be with you this evening. And we're very excited to partner with the township on your park and rec plan. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Jeanette, did you want to add anything? I was just going to say um, one of the things that we want to um, let everybody know that in the coming weeks, um, you will see notifications from our department about opportunities for public input. The master planning process involves an extensive amount of public input, staff input, as well as um, board and planning commission input. And um, there will be a meeting in the springtime that will involve both the board and the planning commission jointly um, for public input. And that'll kind of launch our um, strategy for the master planning process. So there'll be plenty of opportunities for everybody to share what their vision is for all of our parks, trails, and recreation spaces in the community. Thank you. Any board questions? I'll say it's hard to believe it's coming up on five years since we last did this, and um, I uh, am looking forward to it. It's always a good conversation. This is talking about some of the best parts of our community. So. Thank you. Anyone else, Michael? Yeah, I'd just like to say you know, I'm really excited about this. Uh, the board has done a substantial amount of work in the last two months going over our um, priorities and township parks, township properties and things like that. And our approach to that was central. It, it, was, it, was, it was pretty key to that. So um, I think this is fantastic. I'm really excited. Um, and we already do a fantastic job and our CLS is you know, nationally award, you know, recognized. So um, we wanna keep that going. Okay. Um, I just want to echo what uh, Stephen and Michael said. Um, I think this is really exciting and I'm really looking forward to um, getting some public input. So that will be great. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, great. Clerk Segrist, can you please take a, a roll call on the motion? Orninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Lily. Aye. Graham Hudak. Aye. Peter Thai Slavens. Aye. Snyderman. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, Laura and Jeanette. Item G8, consider award of bid and approval of purchase order to Stewart Mechanical for the replacement of air conditioning unit system at fire station number one and associated 2021 fire budget amendment. Ma'am Supervisor, I move that the board approve to uh, move to award the bid and approve a purchase order to Stuart Mechanical at 2275 North Updike Road, Suite A, Auburn Hills, Michigan, 48326, for the replacement of air conditioning unit system at fire station number one in the amount of $24,730 to be paid from the account number listed, capital outlay building, and to approve the uh, attached budget amendment to the 2021 fire budget. Support. Thank you. On January 21st, 2021, an invitation to bid was advertised for the replacement of air conditioning unit system at Fire Station 1. As a result, five bids were returned. The low bid provided was not to the specifications detailed in the ITB scope of work and verified via email that they could not replace the unit to the specifications at their proposed quote. Therefore, 
Stuart Mechanical is the lowest qualified bidder with a bid of 24,730 to be paid from the listed account, capital outlay, outlay building. Additionally, a budget amendment is necessary to increase the 2021 fire fund balance appropriation account as listed by $24,730 and to increase the 2021 fire capital outlay buildings account as listed. Greg, did you wanna add anything else? Um, I don't have anything else to add. Uh, Director Stockline can probably add more specifics about if, if anybody has any um, questions about, I guess between the two of us, we can probably answer any questions. Thanks, Chris, did you have anything to add? Uh, I would just say that, um, yeah, like, like Greg said, if we have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, any questions? Tanya? Yeah, uh, so when during the strategy sessions that we had, we talked about, you know, having, you looked into, you looked into, uh, you know, renewable energy options and you talked about energy efficiencies when we are going to have new equipment like air conditioning or heating. And um, I was just wondering if, um, if this was taken into consideration while uh, looking at the bid. Um, for installing uh, equipment, I can I can answer that. So, um, on not so much on the air conditioning unit, but on the next um, the next uh, item on the agenda where the furnaces are. Um, so, um, without doing a full like geothermal system or, or trying to add that into a station with solar panels and all that. Um, this, these are high efficiency furnaces compared to what was originally installed in 97. So um, we have upgraded the efficiency of the furnaces um, when we went out to bid on these. Okay, yeah, I, that, yeah, I saw that two items there and I, my question was for both the items. So thank you so much, Chris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, any other questions? Okay, clerk secrets, please take roll call on the motion. Korninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Ganguly. Aye. Graham Hudak. Aye. Sigurstein Slavens. Aye. Steinemann. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Item G9. Consider a budget amendment, award of bid, and approval of purchase order to Long Mechanical for the furnace replacement to Fire Station 1, an associated 2021 fire budget amendment. Ma'am Supervisor, I move to award the bid and approve a pro, uh, purchase order for Long Mechanical at 190 East Main Street, Northville, Michigan, 48167 for the furnace replacement at fire station number one in the amount of $21,730 be paid from the account number listed, capital outlay building, and to approve the attached budget amendment for the 2021 fire budget. Court. Thank you. On November 5th, 2020, an invita invitation to bid was advertised for the furnace replacement of Fire Station 1, as a result, five bids were returned with Long Mechanical as the lowest bidder in the amount of $21,730 to be paid from listed account, capital outlay building. Additionally, a budget amendment is requested to increase the 2021 Fire Fund Balance Appropriation account as listed by $21,730 and to increase the 2021 Fire Capital Outlay Buildings account as listed. So Chris, would you like to add to anything? Um, I guess probably just a little summary on some of this and the reason that it's coming back for the um, budget amendments is because we had this actually budgeted in 19. Um, we, we did not complete it in 19 because we were going to move it into the capital improvement project um, and that did not happen. So 2020 obviously COVID and we went out to get these quotes. And that's why you see the two different quotes. The original quote went out with just the furnaces. And when we realized that we went back out for the second quote on the ACs which enhance is why there are two different companies quoting on this same um, kind of same job where we would normally have one company doing it, but because the quotes came back with different companies, that's why you see it the way it is. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Any questions? Clerk Seegers, please take a roll call on the motion. Minsky. Aye. Foster. Aye. Nguli. Aye. Van Hudak. Aye. Seegers, aye. Slavens. Aye. Snyderman. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Item G10, consider awarding contract and approve a purchase order for door replacement at Summit on the Park. 
And supervisor, I move to award the contract and approve a purchase order for the door replacement at Summit on the Park to International Distribution Network door and hardware at 37250 Plymouth Road, Livonia, Michigan, 48150 in the amount of $55,580. The funds will be paid from the account number listed, Capital Improvement Plan. Support. Thank you. On January 7, 2021, five proposals were returned for the door replacement at Summit on the Park as identified in the Capital Improvement Plan. A selection committee comprised of leisure services and finance staff interviewed and scored the five companies based on set criteria detailed in the request for proposal. After careful evaluation, we are recommending international distribution network door and hardware for the door replacement at Summit on the Park in the amount of $55,580. Uh, Greg, did you want to add to that? It's pretty straightforward. And good quotes, um, good process, and it's within budget, so... Right. Anybody have any questions? Michael? What does a $56,000 door look like? <laughs> I don't it's think it's, it's very, very pretty. Um, it's uh, much more than one door. <laughs> so there's a, a fair amount of doors being replaced. If you look at the background information, <laughs> as several doors that are being replaced. Yeah. So. I, guess. I read the scope of work. I'm. Yeah. Any other questions? Any others? Okay. Clerk Seegers, please take a roll call on the motion. Korninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Vinguli. Aye. Jim Hudak. Aye. Seegers, aye. Slavens. Aye. Aye. Motion passes item G11. Consider awarding bid for full size utility vehicle to be used at Pheasant Run Golf Club. Madam Supervisor, I move to award bid for full size utility vehicle 46061 Van Dyke Avenue in Utica, Michigan, 48317, in the amount of $20,329.41 to be paid from the account number listed Capital Outlay Machinery and Equipment. Support. Thank you. On February 11, 2021, an invitation for bid was advertised for a full-size utility vehicle to be used at Pheasant Run Golf Club. Three bids were returned with wine guards being the lowest bidder. Leisure Services is recommending to award the bid to wine guards at a cost of $20,329.41 to be paid from account listed capital outlay machinery and equipment. Uh, Greg, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so this is a piece of equipment we use a lot to get around the golf course. The old uh, piece is no longer usable. Um, it's smaller vehicles, light enough to get around um, the carts, uh, the cart paths without doing any damage. Um, we did look at electric options for this, and we weren't able to identify a piece with um, comparable. Um, capabilities such as the four wheel drive and the winch and some of the items that we um, need um, for, for this equipment out on the course. All right, thank you. Any questions? No. Clerk Segrist, please take a roll call on the motion. Warninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Inguli. Aye. From Hudek. Aye. Seegers, aye. Slavens. Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Item G12. Consider approving a one year contract extension with Westland Car Care for towing services. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve a one year contract extension with Westland Car Care for towing services with no change in rates through April 30th, 2022. Support. Thank you. The police department is requesting a one-year contract extension for towing services with West End Car Care to end April 30th, 2022. West End Car Care has agreed to hold all fees at their current contract rate, which was approved by the Township Board in 2017. Did you want to add anything, Chad? I think I should. I think it's important to ask for this. This same um, billing that they had since 17, they, they missed the bid process. And the reason I'm asking this from the board is provide context um, for general vehicles there's a $65 charge with Westland Car Care in our current contract the towing 
as presented by this other company was $145, which is 100% higher. Another example is um, storage per day. They're charging $45 an hour. That's what they came back with their bid. And the storage from Westland Car Care is $10 a day. So it's a 400% higher cost. And especially in the environment today when we're trying to you know, take care of and readjust and pivot in law enforcement. A lot of people that lose their vehicle to towing because of the police intervention, they're, they're not in the best financial situation and to uh, put this cost onto them is probably not the, uh, uh, the position the township should take. So I'm asking for um, to continue this contract and rebid and publicly announce it in, a, in another way uh, in 22 so we get more bidders. Thank you. Any questions? Great. Clerk Segrist, please take a roll call on the motion. Warninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Nguli. Aye. Van Hudek. Aye. Segrist, aye. Slavens. Aye. Snyderman. Aye. Motion passes. Item G13. Consider approving a proposal from Hagera Health Incorporated for an embedded social worker one-year pilot program and an associated 2021 police budget amendment. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve the proposal from Hagera Health Incorporated for a one-year embedded social worker services contract in the amount of $82,907 to be paid in monthly installments of $6,908.92 and to approve the 2021 police budget amendment as attached. Support. Thank you. The police department is requesting the board approve a proposal from Hagera Health for embedded social worker services. The contract will be for a one-year pilot program totaling $82,907 to be paid in monthly installments of $6,908.92. A budget amendment is also included to fund this program. Uh, Chad, did you have anything to add? Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, considering this action. You know, you know, our mission statement with the police department's excellence and service and the township, you know, is forward thinking with their vision statement. And we're trying to be ahead of the game. The deputy chief thought about this probably approximately three, four years ago. And in recent times, we thought it was an opportunity, while it's not budgeted, is to request the board for allowing us to transfer money from our fund balance, which is healthy. Um, they, we assembled a panel. Uh, we went out for bid. We had some um, good relationships with both Hygera and GrowthWorks. Um, both of those were bidders. The third company uh, we don't have a relationship with, and the other two were shining through the panel. And on the panel, we had Deputy Chief Craig Wilshire, the financial analyst for the township, Mike Shepard, which was on the call earlier tonight, Barb Caruso, who's an ex executive assistant, and Police Lieutenant Joe Biley. Um, the proposal was broken down by the quality of the proposal, the means and methods and references and cost. 40% where there was greatest separation was uh, between high gear and it's what I'm requesting to hire as a contracted service. That was where the separation was. And they, they perform a great service for us currently in training our officers uh, with crisis intervention. Um, they really separated themselves with they're ready to hit the ground running with mental health, which is our major issue in our township. While it's co-mingled with substance abuse, like all things, they are working with us currently right now for crisis intervention, place, placement for people who need treatment immediately. Um, half our department are crisis intervention officers now. They, they help uh, with us to set up the program. Um, Both Works was a, a great company. I should tell the board too, their proposal is um, $12,000 higher than what GrowthWorks uh, put forth. And they came down to those two and the panel graded them out for our purchasing policy and they came out uh, number one. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments? Stephen? Um, thanks, Chad. Um, uh, I'm so glad that we're going to address this and um, take these steps forward. We're a forward-thinking community, and you're you have a forward-thinking department. Um, so much so that um, you were ahead of the game also on creating the diversion program in the past, and um, which is really a great example 
in the region. And I was just wondering how the two would interact together with, uh, and, and work together. And would there be any issues with that? We don't foresee any issues, but there is a high level of competition right now with substance abuse. And we have varying opinions. You know, we have FAN that's doing great work. We have both works. It's helped us start the Wayne Rescue Recovery Program. That was very uh, much forward thinking, we thought, and still is today. And we have Hygera who's doing substance abuse work too. So the interaction is quite competitive. They're fighting for the same dollars through the state of Michigan. Um, my opinion is, you know, when we're trying to resource broker and have help people in their, their crisis, we cannot alienate any program. And my many conversations with all the different vendors is we're not going to say your program is not good for any specific individual. We want good programs servicing all the people that come through our agency or have contact with our agency. And I believe the social worker will be a, a good resource for the entire township, especially as we're trying to rebound from this last year, there's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of side effects that we don't even know to the state. And with this program, we'll have an opportunity to revisit it with this board. There's a good, I, I, got, I got a gut feeling that we're gonna be asking for more at some point, but I can't, I can't say that today, or I'd be asking for two today. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, Summer? Um, thank you, Chad, for your, um, your hard work on this program. I know that it has been a long time coming, and I know that you have been really thoughtful um, in, um, in putting out the RFP and evaluating um, the proposals that came in, you and your team. Um, my question is, um, so when a community member in crisis interacts with someone, with the, the social worker that we have embedded, what will there be their um, interaction be? Will it just be with the social worker connecting them to resources and services, or would it be um, like a long time, long term monitoring situation? Well, we what we did learn through the process is a master's degree level clinician would be important because they'll be able to provide service and be a resource broker. So it, it could be um, bifurcated at the onset. I think it's important to, for everyone to know there's a demarcation here too. The police will, will not have access to those private counseling services, even though we're paying for this vended service um, is very clear. Um, I guess for consistency too, it's going to be a single individual from the vendor that's going to be embedded at the police department. This won't be a rotating door. The expectation is they bring their own equipment, they maintain um, their data. Uh, we will be able to report back on numbers, but not specifics necessarily. We we'll want to make sure our resources, our, our referrals go into, um, you know, the social worker. If it's more mundane, there won't be a need necessarily to call them out to any specific scene, but if it's a situation where there is um, um, an urgency, we'll have that access. But I see it more of a just navigating just the world that we live in that have so many, there's so many people in need for um, different services. We know for certain we have approximately 400 um, mental health issues that we know for certain. And most of the foundations of substance abuse, we understand that. And that's where I go back to the, the uh, um, three, three to four different agencies competing for the same dollar. So it, it made it real tough for the panel to choose. So, so it was responsible, I thought, to go out for a, a proposal, um, given the dollar amount here, and, uh, and follow our policy. Um, just one more follow-up question. So at the end of the pilot year, um, what will you be looking at to determine if you want to expand the program or change the program in some way? We'll look at all the metrics. It's um, what, how many referrals there were, what area were the referrals made, where there were maybe shortcomings. I, I would imagine that once we get into this, we're going to learn that the need will increase once the knowledge becomes known that we uh, offer that. So we have to evaluate how far we get into the, um, providing this type of service as a police department. Um, I think that's going to be critical to understand 
how far we're going to uh, dip our toe in this water. But we know for certain that uh, there are people in need from hoarding to substance abuse, and we've been dealing that. We do very well with crisis. We can we can mitigate the crisis on day one. It's it's right afterwards. What happens? And we expect repeat sir, repeat calls for service to uh, um, be limited on some occasions, and more importantly, the service level for these individuals in these various crises to go up. So we'll see. Uh, I'll just. I just want to say that having heard from um, community members that have reached out to the police department when their families were in crisis and from police officers that had to have dealt with some of these crises, I commend you um, for wanting to bring this program forward. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Um, first of all, Chad, I want to thank you for um, the conversations that we've had on this and the diversion program. Um, I appreciate, um, especially today, that you alleviated some of the concerns that I had. Um, I wanted to follow up on Summer's first question. Um, and so I, I'm trying to understand what your picture of the program is when a when a social worker has a contact with um, someone and can maybe connects them with services, then is there going to be any sort of long-term um, monitoring or relationship with that individual to, to make sure that either the services are working out or that they're continuing to go to um, whatever you know, agency they may have been connected with or, or just how, how are we gonna make sure that, um, you know, however they've been referred that that um, subsequent relationship is working out for them? There will be challenges in that regard because I think I'm gonna be limited by law and um, to knowing how deep the, um, the day two to day three to day six months later, what what actually has been done in the long term. I'll know the referral is, has occurred. And I would imagine I'll have some antidotes uh, that will come back, but I won't know the details of it. You know, when you're talking about mental health issues that are referred and they go into long-term treatment, I, I won't know. I won't be allowed to know that information. I don't know if that answers your question. So my, I guess my question is, what is this, like the social worker, I would assume would be able to get that kind of information, or maybe I'm completely wrong. And I'm not asking for you to get the information. I'm wondering what is the nature of, um, of the follow-up? Like, will the social worker be following these families or individuals to make sure that um, they are getting the help that they need? Yeah, I understand your question a little bit better. Tracking, that, that'd be an expectation that they, they track different um, individuals that they come in contact with throughout the process. Um, I won't know exactly all the details, but I'll know that what treatment occurred and, but I won't know the, the, the details of success. Okay. All right, thank you. Tanya? Okay, um, first of all, um, thanks for bringing in this program to the community. I think it's, um, it is really needed um, as because um, we are seeing so many, um, there has been so much cut in mental health dollars, the statewide funding and other resources available. So I think this is a great initiative. Um, I just had a couple of questions. First of all, um, you said that, you know, because Growth Works, I think um, also works with the diversion program and following up on Stephen's question, you said something about purchasing policy that diverted you to the decision to get Hira in there. Higura to be our cho your chosen um, uh, vendor. So, uh, what can you elaborate a little on that? I, I, hey, I, I think I understand you. what what separated the two. Why why is Higura chosen by the panel over GrowthWorks? Yeah, because GrowthWorks, like you know, GrowthWorks also is working with the diversion program. That right. so my question is two phase. First of all, what what motivate like you know what is the factor that made you choose Hagira? and the second question is 
is it going to conflict with growth works going uh, working on the um, with the diversion program that you already have because they were also a vendor that you know applied for this. Yeah, that's a, two good questions there. I'll start with the second one. Uh, at the onset of this, my conversations were with GrowthWorks about how to bring this uh, program to be to fruition as a resource broker. Um, their statements to me uh, multiple times were they just want this program to succeed in Canton. If they don't get it, they don't get it. They understand. That was our last conversation before we went out to, uh, uh, for the proposal. Um, what separated the two, according to the panel, and I look at the information, the quality of the proposal was 10%, 40% was means and methods, 20% were references, everything was real close. The cost, there was a separation there because high gear was uh, more expensive, but what probably changed the, uh, um, or made the decision for the panel was the means and methods. And when we look at that method of service provisions, it's crisis intervention, mental health, psychological assistance, support advocacy, coordinates with the youth diversion program, which is growth works, police liaison, um, case management services, mediation, referral service, conflict resolution, and training for the officers, um, de-escalation and harm reduction techniques, domestic violence intervention, which is working with another vendor, which is first step. Uh, crisis intervention, team referrals, and school resources. So there's, this is going to be multifaceted. And when it comes to some of the main crisis that occurs to us, the 400 a year, the majority of those are what we felt high gear could hit the ground running. And it doesn't discount all the great work for the 25 years I've been here that Growth Works has done for us. That's, that's for certain. Okay. Um, thank I, I know you. what Jamie, Jamie White is, is on. And she, she, she may be, uh, it might be a good idea to uh, promote her to ask some questions of uh, her position at High Gira and how she uh, will be a vendor for us in, in the contractor service. So I don't know, Madam Supervisor, if you want to promote her for the board to ask her a few questions. Um, yeah, and I have another question uh, about, you know, how um, the social worker work on their like, you know, how is, is the police department going to determine how the functions are, they are going to work on their own and how are, how is, how is this vendor going to work with you? Like, have you decided on yeah. how the workflow happens? Yeah, the, the workflow generally, most generally will be referrals from the police. There's, a, there's, there's programs already in place by everyone we deal with right now. They'll help us get the individual into the, the proper service. It would. Some things are required by law. Yeah, there's a mental health code that we just, we take custody of that person because they need immediate treatment. What this helps us resolve are things that, where we, we don't have police power. Our, our, the situation has a period for us, it's over. But we still know that the individual needs treatment. That's where we introduce this vendor. They can come in and help bring some type of uh, help to the situation. Because we know when we walk away that the problem hasn't been resolved. There's a substance abuse issue. There's a family trouble that needs um, some type of intervention way beyond what a police officer can do. And the uniform is a barrier in itself. Then we don't, we're not social workers and we're not psychologists, but we can mitigate any crisis. So like safety, then we can move on. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Michael? I have a question. Are we still doing the um, Wayne County Rescue Recovery? Yes. Yes. And, okay. Um, and that's administered by Growth Works? Yes. It's been an exceptional program. Their coaches are the finest trained, in my opinion. Um, they do great work. And um, that was an exceptional program, and it's been zero cost to the township zero cost. And then um, we do the diversion program still. Yep. yep. That was zero cost to the township at this point. Um, it's funded through the state. Um, that's how growth works the funding and that's been exceptional too. And now we're expanding it to, to uh, remove some of the disqualifiers that uh, have limited our, uh, our ability to serve more children. 
Okay. Um, so those are two programs that we currently administer that are um, done by one of the, um, the group organizations that bid on this. And, you know, full disclosure to everybody on the board, I'm on the board of directors for GrowthWorks Incorporated. Um, I was appointed um, a year ago. So the township had a well-established relationship with GrowthWorks prior to my being placed on the board at GrowthWorks. And part of the reason why I joined the board at GrowthWorks was because when we had a great idea to create a diversion program, we formulated it with GrowthWorks and established it and made it a reality and got some media attention out of it and put together a pretty successful program. And then when we had an idea to do the rescue recovery program, we got together with GrowthWorks, had a good idea to create a program, got some media attention about it, got a pat on the back from the county executive um, and established that program. And even with this program, when we wanted to embed social workers, the first place we went to for advice was growth work. So, um, you know, I say when I, when I make my comments today, it's, you know, my relationship with growth works, um, it started professionally from an, an admiration for the services that they provided and the partnership that we currently have with that organization. And the fact that they are currently working embedded with our, with our police department. Um, and, um, so my, my number one concern is by bringing in us, so by, 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 by this program going out to bid and, and, and now bringing in a secondary vendor, a secondary service provider, um, and we by, by our own admission have, have no say in the direction of services, how do we ensure, like how do we ensure we're not cannibalizing those other two programs? How do we ensure that um, services are, you know, that we're, that we're protecting kind of our existing programs because they are effective. And, um, and I know those competitions, my wife, to further complicate things, works for one of the Wayne County care management organizations, Starfish Family Services. She's a master's level, level three certified IMH social worker who does community mental health. Uh, I am surrounded by this. And I understand the industry. I understand how kind of cutthroat it can be. I understand how competitive it can be. Um, and so that's my, my primary concern is protecting those two existing programs. My, my, my secondary concern is the fact that I, I don't know that it's efficient sometimes to bring on a secondary organization to conduct similar, if not the same level of services. So can you speak to kind of like the parameters we put in place to make sure that we are, um, not having a redundancy of service and that we are ensuring the structure of those two programs, both the one at the park and with youth in the pro community for, for diversion. And, and the second one being getting people in touch with the peer recovery coaches, as opposed to putting them into like, say like the local level, like the, the Livonia location for substance abuse disorder treatment. Well, we have the, the oversight with the command staff. We have, um, we have a strong structure in place as uh, administrators in the police department and an expectation of the vendor to work well with our, our friends and our other vendors. And they're doing that now because they, they're coming in to uh, provide services for individuals in need. We're calling them out um, the day of or the day after to homes in the Canton Township um, for crisis intervention um, and for uh, different types of services. This would just have, I think the need is so great. It, it's, I, I, I don't think it's gonna be that challenging. And um, I, I think Jamie, it might be a good time for her to speak to, well, it's a challenging question. I, I think the need's gonna be so great. I, it won't be so hard, number one. And number two, professionalism is uh, an expectation of any vendor that we bring into this community. And a social worker, a psychologist or a police officer should be focused on what we talked about at the beginning is excellence and service. And if they're not providing that, that's um, we have a remedies for that, which would be the termination of a contract. Right, so I guess what I'm saying is if I start seeing a, a noticeable drop off in children going into our, um, you know, that would be my recourse. Cause I wouldn't know, right? I mean, 
I wouldn't know what's going on with these people post interaction with the police, right? So my recourse would be to look at the peer recovery program that we currently have. And if I see a market drop in participation of what I, th what I personally think of is one of the most innovative and effective programs I've ever seen a municipality implement. If that thing starts dropping off, that would be something we could then um, say, wait a minute, what's going on here a year into this thing? And then my second question is, is with regard to the RBA, I didn't see that we had a bid evaluation. I didn't see that we, we knew what the other two vendors had, 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 had put in for services. And typically when we bid things out, we can kind of compare those two things so that we're not um, kind of asked at the like, kind of the last minute to like, hey, here's the final result of what our bid panel looked at. Um, we have something that we can kind of compare against. And I don't, I don't see that we have that in this RBA. Hey, I apologize that the, uh, it's not, there's not uh, that comparison in there for you. I can tell you um, the top two growth works with a master's degree, your proposal was $70,000. That was prov um, provided at request. Hygiera, $82,970. And the third program, which was STEP, we didn't request a master's degree proposal it, um, because it came down to the last two, according to the panel. And the bachelor's degree proposal was $66,000. Um, Hygiera did not provide a bachelor's degree proposal because they said what we request was. Um, Two grand and a bachelor's degree couldn't uh, provide that same service. At Growth Works, their bachelor's degree degree proposal was sixty six eight five zero. Chief, I'm I'm happy to jump in as well if you wanted me to address the collaboration question. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, a few comments, especially uh, based on what you're doing presently before the implementation of this program. And sure. Answer some of the questions for the uh, board. Yes, absolutely. So um, just to give you a brief overview of um, Hegera Health, we've been in business for about 40 years and have been the primary provider of crisis services in Wayne County. Um, and we currently do mobile crisis co-response with eight departments throughout Wayne County, um, Northville Township, uh, Plymouth, Wayne and Westland, um, Inkster, and we have been doing a pilot project with Canton Township um, since September. Um, during that time, we've received over 200 referrals, and the services that we are providing are very specific to a community-based um, crisis response in the moment um, with police officers. Um, Hegera Health also runs COPE, Community Outreach for Psychiatric Emergencies, which is one of two 24 seven uh, crisis walk-in assessment centers. We are located in Livonia off of Schoolcraft Road. Um, through that program, uh, we're responsible for completing pre-admission reviews for all adults um, that are funded through Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network in Wayne County, which results to over 14,000 requests for service per year. So we are very experienced in providing crisis services um, throughout our work um, and uh, being present in the community. We're also very experienced in um, collaborating and working with different organizations. So uh, we work with GrowthWorks. They are our CMO, obviously, for our children's programming um, and collaborate with them on all of our children and adolescent services through our outpatient clinics. Um, through our role at COPE as well, our stabilization teams work with all of the um, community mental health providers within Wayne County, coordinating services for people in care. Um, and our biggest concern is that people get the care that they need in the moment. And so if you all already have, and it sounds like you do, wonderful established relationships um, with Growth Works. Um, you know, like Chief Ba said, there is more than enough work to go around, and we look forward to building a real um, crisis care continuum for the residents in your community. And I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Any other questions? Kate? Chad, um, I noticed in the packet you had uh, um, 
uh, evaluation criteria that the committee um, used to kind of choose the the vendor for the for the embedded social worker program. Could you talk a little bit about um, what kind of what kind of um, made Higuera stand apart from the other two as far as the evaluation that the, the rubric you have there? The, the finance department helps us set, you know, the percentages of the maximum score and it's broken down by each of the rater's score. They're very consistent throughout, but when you get to uh, the methods of service and what you just heard from Jamie too, that's where they, they, they stood out because they're already in that realm right now of, um, while they can still do all the resource broker, which, uh, which is gonna be very important for us, getting the resources for our citizens, they stood out in their presentation uh, as it relates to crisis intervention, mental health service, psych and psychological assistance immediately. Um, that's, that's where the difference was. Thank you. Is that document in the RBA? I don't, the ratings, um, I believe the ratings were. Uh, the, uh, the rubrics there, um, the scores are not. The scores are not. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not certain why we, we didn't include that. And I don't know if there's a reason behind it or not. So I apologize. Um, I can tell you the scores if you like. Go ahead, Stephen. Okay. Um, I just had a question come to mind, and Ms. White also for you when you spoke um, about the different resources you have. Um, what will be what I'll call the hours of service for this um, program? I mean, it, issues and, and crisis doesn't go on business hours. Um, so will there be um, the availability of someone to be on call or will it be something like the COPE Center that we utilize um, when uh, issues arise in the middle of the night or, or some other or on the weekends, things like that? Yes, yeah, so as far as specific hours that the social worker um, will work, we have not determined that yet. Um, that will be based on the volume provided by the police department on when they're receiving most of these calls. Um, uh, COPE is staffed 24-7. We have supervisors and leadership on site 24-7. So one of the benefits that we see with integrating this program into our existing crisis continuum is that you have the leadership and support already built in um, due to our services that we provide as an organization. So there would be a supervisor available 24 seven um, and the additional support would be provided through COPE and the uh, walk-in center. Okay, thank you. So I assume that like what they had said before in terms of the diversion program, growth works would still handle the diversion program with the, with the youth, is that correct? Yes, that's true. And as Jamie indicated, they, they already work with the CMO, which, you know, um, Growth Works receives those referrals through their other version of the same diversion program, which is through Right Track with Wayne County. Uh, so there is an established relationship with making those referrals. Thanks, Summer. Um, Chad, is there still um, an embedded staffer from um, First Stop um, embedded in the police department? No, we haven't met another township location. Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering about that. Um, the one thing I do want to say about the diversion program is that we all know that there are reasons that kids do not enter the program, um, reasons that they do not qualify um, for the program, whether it's they have had a previous offense or um, the victim of the crime does not give permission um, for the restorative program or the, the offender's parents do not want them to enter the fro program, um, they've been charged with a felony, or um, 
they live in a county outside of Wayne County. Um, and I was just wondering, um, Chad, if you could talk some about the steps that you've taken um, to eliminate some of those barriers to get more kids to participate in the diversion program. Certainly, uh, we notice through you know the oversight, there is a group of people that meet through oversight. And actually, when we did this, we met with the township board and we noticed immediately that there's an issue with um, disqualifiers. Uh, the latest version of our policy, the only disqualifier is in a felony assault, um, felony assault uh, offense. Um, that would be a disqualifier where we'd want it to go through um, diversion. And we're working with Wayne County uh, currently. Uh, we're still about three to four weeks out of receiving a response, but there is a, a domestic violence. Um, we're looking at a program with... Uh, um, domestic violence with Wayne County, where it's talk it out. We've already seen a, a, a change in, in pivot in the, with juveniles for non-intimate partners where custody is, hasn't been the, the focus uh, with that. So um, the cooling off periods uh, uh, taking place in other forms and fashions and the uh, report as required by law is still going to the prosecutor's office within 48 hours. And um, we're hoping uh, we'll get more information on that uh, Talk It Out program with Wayne County where we can refer it um, seamlessly through the same process. Otherwise, we'll, we'll use our diversion program for domestic violence. We're hoping that when you remove the prior arrest it is probably gonna be one of the, the critical, or prior offenses um, will be a, a critical step in limiting or increasing, but limiting the disqualifiers, number one, but also increasing our span to uh, those who come in contact with the police department. And also based on your help, you helped us with uh, Washtenaw County in breaking down that barrier because one of the requirements is that you had to live in Wayne County. Um, we'll look at the program costs. If we get in a situation where Washtenaw County can't work with growth works, uh, on our diversion program, and we'll look at if they can, uh, our funding can be used because the cases are so low um, for Washtenaw County youth committing uh, juvenile offenses in uh, Canton Township. Um, the way it works, their case would be adjudicated through uh, Washtenaw County. That's just how the how um, juvenile offenses work. So we're we're moving in a direction where we would either pay it for of the police budget or Washtenaw County is going to jump aboard. And I thank you for that connection to the, the commissioners of Washtenaw County. Thank you, Chad. Michael. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just kind of finally here sum up my thoughts on, on this. Um, when we initially came up with the program, I was extremely excited, extremely excited for a number of reasons. When I first ride along with Canton PD, it was abundantly clear um, that we had the expectation that police officers acted like social workers with none of the training and none of the resources. And you see on the media where that fails and you see all over the place where that fails and you watch the burden that those guys take home with them after experiencing those um, you know, gut-wrenching and heart-wrenching situations. I mean, it's, it's tough. It's, it's tough work. And they're put in the impossible situation of trying to solve social ills that are, that are worse now than, than, than they probably have ever been. And I get really, really excited about this program. Um, and, you know, and this is an area that, that's near and dear, you know, to my heart. So, you know, first and foremost, when we talk about separating mental health and substance abuse disorder, I would, I would recommend we don't talk about that because substance abuse disorder is a mental health, it's an illness, um, and that's a mental health situation. And both as a recovering addict and alcoholic myself, that's very important to me, not to mention the fact that I have been in the Canton Police Department cell. I have been there. Not recently. Not recently. Not just, not recently. It's been over. It's been well over 17 years since I've had to worry about any of that stuff. But um, pretty well acquainted with a lot of the police force on both sides of the law before and now um, as a policymaker. 
and as a change maker and as somebody who takes the this community's mental health very seriously and how we deal with all of the, the, the challenges that we have. I, um, um, you know, yeah, I've had people reach out to me because they had suicidal thoughts and they took their own life um, shortly after speaking with me. I've just last week walked in Heritage Park with somebody who is struggling um, academically and they were having thoughts of suicide and they're having a substance abuse problem. Um, I am very in this world. Um, and the beauty I think of being in recovery is like, that's, that's actually a gift, right? That's one, I'm uniquely qualified to, to take those walks with people um, because I've, I've walked that path too. Um, and it also, it helps keep me on this side of the law because um, I never forget what it was like to be stuck in all that stuff. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I've seen into this world, I've, I've, I've been a client of Hagira <laughs> in my life. And, um, you know, I, so I, I know most of the care providers, I, I know the, the gambit of services, I, I know this industry extremely well. Um, you know, I, um, I'm involved in a lot of that, in a lot of this stuff. I take it very, very seriously. It's very important to me as an individual. I, I this program sounds lovely. I, I wish I could have seen the other two proposals. Had things gone the other way, I wouldn't have been able to vote on one of them um, for obvious reasons. Um, and I, I wish I could have the opportunity to look at what the other proposals were that were offered. I think um, my one bit of advice is that we manage the relationships we have with, with existing providers as well, especially if they participated in this program. And two, if the board decides this is the way to go, um, that we keep, we keep abreast and we make sure that we're working in partnership on those existing, those existing um, programs that we currently have in place. Because I think that Canton has some unique stuff that we're doing that other communities that aren't doing and, and weren't doing. And I would hate to see that, that go away. Um, but, um, you know, I gotta say short of seeing the other proposal, I can't, I can't vote in favor of this tonight. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, Clerk Segrist, can you please take a roll call on the motion? Berninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Ganguly. Aye. Uh, Graham Hudak. Aye. Segrist, nay. Uh, Slavens. Aye. Snydeman. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chad. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is public comment. I see we still have three people here. Is there any public comment? You can raise your hand. Any public comment from any of you can raise your hands. I don't see any phones. So seeing none. Any statements from the, from the panel here? Anybody, the directors or board members? You know, I think it'd be great as I mean, as we've gone through these, I've seen so many of these that kind of fall in line with our goals. And I think Kate, you had mentioned before that in the school board, they'll have like a, a board goal or a goal that it was meeting. Is that, was that you who told me that? Um, it might've been, but it was actually, I was um, looking at some old township board packets. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wasn't school. We used to do that. We used to do that. That's right. Um, I guess it was five or six years ago when we did a goal setting session. So it might be once we have them all completed, it might be good if we put that in the RBA. Okay. Yeah. There's a position idea. in every RBA that says strategic plan slash goals. Yeah. And um, we just haven't been. This was like called out in a separate line. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think once the board approves our um, new strategic plan, we should definitely implement that struggle with that. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to mention one other thing. I just wanted to um, say to Greg in the 
CLS department that in reading the update, uh, Madam Supervisor, that Amy Houston put out a week ago or 10 days ago, um, you had a lot of cool programs that you guys put on in the winter for people and it was very innovative and I think you guys should be commended for that. Um, it was a lot of fun stuff and, and things have been kind of gloomy in the last year or so and especially in the winter so I, I think you brought some joy to the community. Thank you. I, I certainly appreciate that. Um, you know, I have to credit the, the staff from Leisure Services for that. They, they're just, if you give them a, a little bit of rope, they're going to take it a mile and be extremely <laughs> creative and come up with some of the, the most amazing things and uh, make us all look good, really, because they, they're the ones that do all the, the work and some of the most creative people I've ever met. So it's great to see them get that opportunity and you know, they, were, they were so excited when we were finally able to get moving with some things and came up with some really great things that ideas that are going to continue on even after the COVID world because they've, they've just been so successful that and gotten such great feedback from the community that that's going to be um, something that we continue to do. And, and kind of on that note as well of usage of leisure services programs and facilities, the parks already this year because of the, the quick change in weather are getting unprecedented use for this time of year. I mean, COVID has really driven people into the parks and we're getting more people now and early in the year than we typically get. So um, I just ask the public to be patient with us as we're working on some of those spring projects to get the parks open. Um, now we're, uh, having it's a good challenge but it's definitely a challenge to stay on top of some of the like just the trash pickup and things that usually are um, easy to keep up with by going out once every two weeks to pick up the trash and now we're having to pick it up multiple times a week which it's great that people are using the trash cans and such but it's, it's definitely a challenge for us so if you notice something uh, any board members or public please let us know we'll get to it as quick as we can but no we're doing a lot just to get the parks parts open with, you know, putting up the tennis nets and the screens and the, the playground inspections and everything that we typically do this time of year. And, and Greg's going to be uh, sending something out showing some of our board goals and how they, um, the leisure services team has filled out how they think they've, they're meeting some of them so that that can go to you so you can take a look at it very soon. Um, let me see. Unfortunately, COVID numbers are up as we know, and so we have to continue masking and social distancing and encouraging people to get vaccinated. Um, from what I've heard, um, the Kroger's might be bringing some along soon, right, Chris? That's correct. We heard that uh, today that they could be having up to a thousand uh, vaccinations per day. So that's good news. And we'll get some more information out to the public once we, once we find out. Yeah, so that's very good news. We just have to get the numbers down again. Um, I think that's all we have. Anybody else? Everybody moved into the fire station, just to let you know also, the fire station is operational. Mm -hmm. I already seen some good response times out of there, so that's good, good news for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, I, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Support. Thank you, Cup Seegers. Please take a roll on the motion. Kaninsky. Aye. Foster. Aye. Inguli. Aye. Graham Hudak. Aye. Seegers die. Slavens. Aye. Snydeman. Aye. All right. Everyone, good night. <laughs>